Agriculture and the Subcommittee on Biotechnology, Horticulture and Research. Um, and uh, we will come to order. And I want to thank all the members and those who are uh, participating uh, via Zoom uh, on this uh, joint subcommittee hearing. Um, after uh, opening uh, brief remarks, members will receive testimony from today's witnesses. And then as we uh, do a pro forma, uh, we will allow members to uh, ask questions. You'll have your allocated five minutes alternating between majority and minority members, as we always do. Um, and uh, you'll be ad, uh, asked to recognize. And in this day of Zoom, uh, we all have to remember not only to unmute our mics uh, so that we can uh, make our comments heard or ask our questions, but just as importantly as we've all, I think, uh, had to painfully learn to uh, mute your mics when uh, you're, you're not presenting and, and maybe having a sidebar conversation of sorts, because we don't need that necessarily to become a part of the formal hearing. So um, I just want to remind all of us, uh, so maintain muted uh, to minimize background noise. And uh, I hope to get to as many questions as possible. Uh, let me make my uh, opening statement by saying good morning to everyone again. Uh, I want to thank uh, both uh, Chair uh, Woman Plaskett and uh, uh, members Johnson and Baird and other uh, subcommittee members uh, from both subcommittees. Uh, we know that biotechnology is a critical subject uh, with lots of potential and solving some of our most pressing issues as we try to ensure that we maintain our competitiveness in terms of trade but investing in research and streamlining our regulatory system to help facilitate uh, what America has traditionally done, which is, I think, led the world in terms of uh, the transformation of our ability to produce food and fiber uh, in the most nutritious fashion at the most cost-effective way uh, that has allowed us not only to feed our nation uh, for all American consumers, uh, every every day, but also to allow us to export to feed parts of the world. Uh, and we know that um, with climate change, these challenges become greater. And um, I, I like to hearken back to, uh, you know, we're, we're talking a lot about infrastructure here the last several months and how we invest in America's infrastructure. And, you know, when you talk about agriculture and, and uh, we remember our history, um, two uh, meaningful uh, uh, pieces of legislation were signed uh, a long time ago uh, when President Lincoln was uh, trying to, to keep the country together during the, the Civil War, maybe perhaps our most divided moment in America's history. And on July 1st, uh, he signed the uh, act that created the Transcontinental Railroad to bind the nation uh, from coast to coast. But the very next day, July 2nd, he signed the Mallory Act that created land-grant universities. And I think that uh, is not traditionally seen as infrastructure, but land-grant universities have been part of America's uh, ability to maintain its cutting edge and technology and how much that has transformed our ability to, to be so successful. Throughout our history, farmers have researched uh, ways to optimize their ability to produce livestock and crop production. And um, uh, over the past few decades, but even further back, going back to the development of our land grant university system, uh, working with the private sector, we've been able to figure out ways to grow more sustainable food at a faster rate. And therefore it's, I think, incumbent upon us as policymakers to ensure that we take advantage of the latest cutting edge technology uh, because with climate change, we know uh, just last week, the Department of Defense uh, highlighted 13 countries in the world in which water allocation is gonna be so critical that their ability to maintain stability in those countries is going to be a question mark. And so, um, you know, whether it's uh, biotechnology, more drought resistant plants, or whether it's technologies to use water more efficiently are all part of what we have to do. The staggering doubt, drought that we're having in the West is a reflection of these changes in climate. And in California, uh, we're seeing drought conditions that we've not seen since 76 and 77. Um, and so I'm very familiar as a third generation farmer in California, the consequences 
So I'm very interested in the innovative solutions that the panel will, will provide today. The testimony of our witnesses, I think, provides us opportunities to learn of new technological advancements <clears throat> in light of climate change and how we optimize the use of our water. As we like to say in California, where water flows, food grows. Um, so while I believe we must address the underlying problems that are involved in climate change, and we're hoping to do that as a part of this infrastructure package, we also need to begin to adapt to other changing conditions. Uh, and we need to look at the experts on how we can do a better job uh, down the horizon. Uh, and um, whether we're talking about at home or abroad, changing populations and straining our food systems, uh, we see how supply chain shocks uh, impact our ability to put food on America's dinner table. When you close restaurants and, and schools as we did last spring, you take a complex, complicated food supply chain and you turn it upside down. And we're still in, dealing with the consequences of that. And then we see, uh, well, um, obviously we must strengthen supply chains when we see uh, the circumstances in our ports and harbors and the uh, bottlenecks that have taken place in recent months, uh, how more difficult it is in fact to, to make that supply chain operate in a way that reflects our needs of our country and uh, who we trade with around the world. Uh, so there's a lot of impacts here. There's a lot of complexity. Uh, and I think this hearing will help us uh, focus on a number of these issues. I look forward again to hearing uh, with the four experts that are bringing wealth of knowledge in biotechnology and agriculture. Their testimony will provide important information. So now uh, I'd like to uh, defer to um, the um, uh, ranking member from uh, South Dakota, Mr. Johnson, for any opening remarks that he would like to give. And then our subcommittee chair from uh, uh, the uh, wonderful U.S. Virgin Islands, uh, Stacy Plaska, will have her opening statement with her ranking member as well. So um, uh, Representative Johnson from South Dakota, please, uh, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And I agree uh, with Ms. Plaskett. It is good to see GT and uh, good to see you looking well, uh, Mr. Ranking Member. Uh, I, I think it's good we're doing this hearing together because clearly technological advances, innovation, they have had a tremendous impact on livestock and on horticulture. And we're gonna get a lot more done together than we would separately. So uh, thank you to both chairmen for making this happen. There is a moral and a technological issue uh, that's facing this committee and society. How are we gonna feed a growing world at the same time that we work to be good stewards of our environment? Uh, I suspect you all know the numbers. The United Nations Population Division expects there'll be nearly 10 a billion people on this planet by the year 2050. And we are called to feed the world. And we're not going to do that. We're not going to succeed without innovation, without technology. Uh, embracing innovation and technology, we will increase weight gain, we'll increase yields, uh, we'll reduce our carbon footprint, we'll improve animal welfare. Uh, and again, we're only going to do these things by embracing ingenuity, progress, and innovation. Uh, and agriculture has a positive story to tell. It is innovation that has allowed our producers to produce more food with fewer resources. And certainly livestock producers in South Dakota and elsewhere uh, have been doing that by adopting things like uh, genetically enhanced EPDs, uh, IVF and embryo transfer, as well as extensive artificial insemination to increase profitability and the efficiency of the genetics, which are so critically important. Uh, but the technology is advancing even further though. We have a tendency uh, so often when we're talking about technological improvements in ag to focus on crops and, and there has been a lot there. But I would tell you that the, the pace of change is accelerating on the livestock side as well. Uh, from disease resistant pigs to pulled Holstein cattle, these innovations have the potential to vastly improve uh, the production landscape. So I look forward uh, to hearing from our panel on what is and what is not working uh, with our current laws and regulations. Uh, for example, where we stand on efforts like uh, the implementation of bioengineering food disclosure standard and views on how the coordinated framework can and should be applied to GE livestock and any other evolving regulatory hurdles. 
Uh, making progress on these issues will also require an international approach. And, and uh, Madam Chairman and Mr. Chairman, as I close, uh, let, let's just be frank. There are too many in this world who cast doubts uh, on science as a tool. And they lo actively lobby international institutions to adopt their anti-innovation agenda. And I look forward to working with this committee in, in a bipartisan way to ensure that the United States maintains a science-driven regulatory system and that we actively advocate that position abroad that's going to mean a lot of consumer education. It's also going to mean working uh, through uh, trade agreements and relationships so that we can maintain internationally uh, a predictability on standards that our producers need uh, to feed the world and be good stewards of the environment. So with that, Mr. Chairman, I look forward to working with you and, and all others on the committee on these, uh, on these issues. Thank you, and I yield back. Well, I thank the gentleman, and I couldn't agree with you more. I think that uh, a strong science-based regulatory framework is what we need to do to have uh, an international standard that we can all comply with, uh, I think, phytosanitary standards, uh, not only in this country, but around the world, need to be um, uh, shared and respected. Um, and uh, But I feel that way on, on all bases. I think uh, public health needs to be science-based as well, and I just uh, get very frustrated when I see some people ignoring the importance and the success that science has allowed us to, to make such important progress on. Having said that, I am so excited to have our subcommittee chair, uh, Ms. Plaskett from the U.S. Virgin Islands, uh, who's um, uh, I've had the pleasure to work with over the years, and uh, she chairs the Biotechnology, Horticulture, and Research Subcommittee uh, for opening remarks uh, that I know that she has. And Ms. Plaskett, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, one, this looks to be in a very informative hearing today as we discuss the advancements and application, <coughs> excuse me, of agricultural biotechnology. Um, thank you, Mr. Costa. Chair of the Subcommittee on Livestock and Foreign Agriculture Subcommittee for your in convening this hearing and sharing your expertise. This sort of collaboration will help us all, <coughs> excuse me, all view our work on the Agriculture Committee through a broader lens and facilitate more holistic conversations as we look ahead to the next Farm Bill. Today's hearing will be an opportunity for members to learn and evaluate the regulatory framework of agriculture biotechnology and engage with experts in plant and animal agricultural innovation. I look forward to hearing updates on innovation coming down the pipeline, as well as what we on the Agriculture Committee can be doing to ensure these innovations are getting into the right hands to produce more resilient food supply and generate opportunities in our agriculture committee communities. I would like to highlight the exciting research that's going on in my district in the University of the Virgin Islands Agricultural Experiment Station and working on phytobiotechnology research in traditional Caribbean crops such as papaya, passion fruit, pineapple, cassava, sweet potato varieties, and more. This important research is working to develop varieties of crops that are disease resistant, better adapted to local soil types and provide a multiple of other benefits. I would also like to, at this time, submit for unanimous consent the following letter by the Agricultural Stakeholders Community for the record. Hearing no opposition, the uh, information will deem accepted. Uh, by Thank you. Again, I look forward to having an informative and productive dialogue today and to working with the chair and both ranking members here as we continue this discussion. With that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Subcommittee Chair, for those uh, insightful comments. Uh, I share your enthusiasm for uh, this morning's uh, two subcommittee hearings, uh, joint hearings, I should say. Um, Mr. Baer, um, you're recognized for any opening remarks you'd like to give. Well, good morning. And I want to thank you, Mr. Chairman and Chairwoman Plaskett, for calling this hearing today. I appreciate our friends from the Livestock and Foreign Agriculture Subcommittee for also joining us for this discussion. 
And I'm very excited to see our subcommittees to have the opportunity to discuss this incredibly important topic. I'm also happy to see our ranking member, G.T. Thompson, with us as well. But I want to thank our witnesses for joining us today for this dialogue. I look forward to hearing from each one of them about the extensive work and research that they've done in this field. And I want to hear from them their vision of the future for biotechnology and how we can better serve and improve this technology moving forward. From my perspective, biotechnology is the future of agriculture and the future of food security for our changing planet. It has the ability to reshape the direction of our industry and our world as we strive to advance the sustainability of agriculture, improve animal health and well being, and plays a role in all the efforts to feed, clothe, and fuel our ever changing planet. However, uh, this can only be the case if we are able to take advantage of this technology and allow innovation to happen. At the present time, I don't think our regulatory system is keeping up with the technology of the products that are being developed from this industry. And so our system needs to improve and become more uh, rapid about approving biotechnology products. So I look forward to our conversation this morning between our guests and colleagues and truly hope that this hearing will be a fruitful exercise guiding future debate legislation and regulatory changes. I value this as an opportunity to hear directly from the industry and academia about our current regulatory framework, how the system does or doesn't work, and how we can balance what industry needs to make this technology successful against an important need for consumer trust and confidence. I hope to hear about upcoming changes to these regulatory frameworks and what benefits and challenges they may bring to the industry. Rulemaking like the SECURE rule, the Bioengineered Food Disclosure Standard, and rulemakings on the horizon like FDA's guidance on gene editing plants, EPA's PIP rule, and USDA's ANPR on nanobiotechnology. That Ms. Plaskett and I recently sent a letter to USDA encouraging all of those involved to take advantage of this tremendous opportunity to shape the industry. And I look forward to hearing directly from our stakeholders to what extent we can take advantage of this technology. So far in the commercial life of these products, interagency cooperation has had a tremendous impact on the success or lack thereof for biotech products. I hope that our witnesses today will share with us their experiences and thoughts regarding this cooperation and how this process can be improved. As we continue to work domestically on how best to bring current and future biotech advancements to market, it is tremendously important that we keep an eye on and actively participate in how our trade partners, particularly those with large impacts on the demand for US ag products, advance their own regulatory and regulations for these products. We must continue to ensure that these partners continue to regulate on a basis of science and risk, not speculation and fear, and ultimately ensure that we don't inadvertently innovate ourselves out of the global marketplace. As I've mentioned many times before, I have a real passion for agriculture and for better understanding the opportunity that surrounds innovation and technology in our industry. At a time when technology continues to quickly advance, our policy must be able to keep up an effort to ensure safety, transparency, and fairness in the marketplace. I truly hope that today's conversations will shed additional light on what this policy should look like in the ideal world. And I look forward to today's conversation and really appreciate the opportunity to engage and to hear from such talented stakeholders. Thank you all again. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. I thank the uh, gentleman from Indiana for his comments. And um, uh, as is customary, uh, when subcommittees hold hearings or meetings, we always afford the opportunity for the chair of the full committee or the ranking member of the full committee to make any uh, comments that they might like to make. Um, and it's my understanding uh, Chairman Scott is uh, unable to be here at this point in time, although if he joins us later on, we will certainly uh, love to hear his comments or thoughts. 
Uh, I do see the ranking member of the full committee, uh, Representative G.T. Thompson from Pennsylvania. And uh, uh, if uh, the ranking member would like to make uh, some comments at this time, we certainly would afford him that opportunity. Well, Chairman, thank you so much. Uh, thank you for this hearing. Uh, first of all, just thank you for all the well wishes, thoughts, prayers, uh, the text. Uh, it's, just, it's great to be work to work with such a great farm team uh, that works hard for the best interests of, uh, you know, quite frankly, of, of uh, rural America and those folks that work so hard each and every day to provide us our food, our fiber, our building resources, and our energy. Um, uh, thank you to you, Chairman uh, Costa, Chairwoman Plaskett, uh, Ranking Member Johnson, and Ranking Member Baer for holding a hearing on this exciting topic. I will say, uh, Chairwoman Plaskett, you made me hungry when you're going down that list of, uh, of great uh, uh, agricultural products that you all produce. So uh, good stuff. And I want to say thank you to our distinguished panel of witnesses for agreeing to participate and share your expertise. Uh, it, if appropriately embraced, agriculture biotechnology holds tremendous promise for addressing many of the challenges facing our nation, and namely the challenge of sustainably feeding a rapidly growing population. You know, we all know this, and this hearing is important because it, it puts it on record. American agriculture is about science, technology, and innovation. That's what that, it, it always has been since those very first early day settlers who, and yes, it was crude, it was rudimentary, and, and, the, and the reason to do it was just so their family could live through another season. But today it's so much more sophisticated, and if embraced, so much more that we can do with it. Um, I look forward to hearing from each of you about uh, the promising advancements on the horizon that will help us achieve that goal. I also look forward to your perspectives on any hurdles that you may be that may be getting in our way. Now, whether that be cumbersome regulation, conflicting international standards, uh, a lack of consumer knowledge and acceptance of technologies, or quite frankly, government bureaucracy that is resistant to uh, adapting this science, technology, and innovation. The, um, the United States has long been a leader in agriculture innovation, and to maintain that competitive edge, it is important that our nation's policies don't inadvertently hamper innovation domestically and ultimately drive that important work overseas. Now, thankfully, the modernization of the regulatory framework for biotechnology has been a bipartisan effort spanning multiple uh, administrations of multiple generations. And I am very pleased with the progress made under the Trump administration from the executive order regarding agriculture biotechnology products, the USDA secure role updating plant technology regulations for the first time in 30 years to the advance notice of proposed rulemaking on much needed reforms to the regulation of genetically engineered animals. I remain hopeful the current administration will continue listening to the needs of the agriculture community as it works to build off that important work. Now, again, uh, thank you all for being here. I look forward to today's conversation. With that, I yield back. Well, we thank the gentleman from Pennsylvania and uh, wish you uh, a quick recovery and hope to see you next week. And uh, so um, with um, uh, those uh, opening statements uh, concluded, uh, we now move into the real purpose of the hearing, and that's to listen to some of the distinguished guests that we have uh, who are experts uh, in their field. Uh, we have four witnesses on the panel uh, this morning, and we wanna thank them uh, for uh, their time and their efforts to provide their presentation to the two subcommittees. Let us begin with our first witness, uh, Dr. Uh, Van Lee Chow, who is the Vice President of the Scientific Affairs and Policy for the American Seed and Trade Association. Remember to keep your mics muted, uh, my fellow colleagues, because uh, it uh, works a lot better that way unless you're recognized. So without further ado, uh, Dr. Fanley Chow, we uh, look forward to hearing your comments this morning. Uh, and you have five minutes uh, and the clock will begin to, uh, on your opening, uh, opening statement. Thank you. Good morning, Chairwoman Plaskett, Chairman Costa, Ranking Member Thompson, Ranking Member Bard, and Ranking Member Johnson and the members of the subcommittee. I am so pleased to be here representing ASTA's nearly 700 member companies at today's hearing. Our members produce everything from grass and turf seed to row crop seed to vegetable and ornamental seed 
to true potato seed, both conventional, genetic engineered, and organic seed markets. ASTA has been around since 1883. So as we consider the current advances in agricultural biotechnology and look forward to the applications in the 21st century, I think it's worthwhile to reflect on the common thread that runs from 1883 to now. And that common thread is plant breeding. So plant breeding has been around since our ancestors domesticated crops. But in the last several decades, plant scientists and plant breeders have accumulated an impressive collection of tools to unlock the genetic potential of plant crops. And using these tools, we have safely and reliably introduced into the food system hundreds of thousands of new plant varieties over the last century. In the 21st century, we are all facing critical challenges to our agricultural food system, climate change, a rapidly growing global population, environmental degradation. The need for new improved plant variety is more pressing than ever. But thankfully, plant breeders have an unprecedented number of tools to drive solutions. The most exciting of late is gene editing. So in agriculture, gene editing is an enabling tool. It supports rather than supplants the fundamentals of plant breeding. It enables our plant breeder to leverage the decades of accumulated scientific discoveries and understanding of plant genetics to increase the accuracy, the precision, and the efficiency of plant breeding. Gene editing is being used across all crops, including specialty crops, and by breeding programs of all sizes, including public universities and small companies. We're using gene editing to work within the plant's genetic family, similar to what is done to what's done in conventional breeding or can occur in nature. So let me share a few examples. The non brownie varieties are being developed for fruits and vegetables, like potatoes, avocados, and lettuce. For potatoes alone, non brownie varieties could eliminate 1.5 billion pounds of wasted potatoes. We're working on water efficient crops from lettuce to wheat to rice. We're using gene editing to discover cover crops that can be cash crops, bringing both environmental and economic benefits. It's used to encourage healthy eating, modifying soybeans so it's heart healthy, to make berries more consistent and more available to consumers. And many of these examples are based on public and private partnerships. But whether these examples and others like them and the tremendous benefits they can provide becomes widely available would depend in part on research investment and more notably on the policy and regulatory environment in the US and around the world. ASTA, we commend the regulatory improvement that USDA has made in its final rule for biotech regulation that was published in May 2020. That final rule recognizes the longstanding safety record associated with plant breeding and exempt certain types of plants that could have been done through conventional breeding or occur through nature. And we look forward to working with USDA to implementing the various elements of that final rule. We also appreciate the proposed rule by EPA and we look forward to the leadership by EPA's administrator in getting that rule to the finish line. Finally, we are awaiting clarifying guidance from FDA. It is critical that these three agencies are consistent and coordinated in their policy approach. In closing, the 21st century is looking right at us. We're in the middle of it. We have the tools to develop solutions to the challenges facing our food system. But to ensure those tools are widely accessible across all crops, across operations of all sizes, production methods, and geographies, it is important to maintain strong investment in plant breeding research. And for domestic and international policies to be clear risk-based, risk-proportionate, science-based, and harmonized. Otherwise, innovation would be limited to a very, very few crop varieties, and the benefits will never be fully realized across a broad agricultural sector. I really appreciate the opportunity to share my thoughts with you today, and I'll be happy to take any questions, and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, <clears throat> Dr. Uh, Family Chow, and, uh... I like your uh, screensaver, it's a nice backdrop. Uh, but um, we uh, now move on to our next uh, witness today, uh, Dr. Alea, um, uh, Chief Scientific Officer for Genesis uh, PLC. Uh, and um, Dr. Rice, uh, please uh, begin with your opening statement to the time clock there. Uh, we look forward to hearing your comments. 
Chairman Kostich, Chairwoman Plaskett, and Ranking Members Thompson, Johnson, and Baird, and members of the committee. My name is Dr. Elena Rice, and I'm the Chief Scientific Officer of Genus PLC. I also serve on the board of the Biotechnology Innovation Organizations, Agriculture and Environment Governing Board. I'm honored to testify before you today to discuss how innovation in animal breeding will help to protect our food supply, feed our grown growing population and create more healthy and sustainable food system. Genus PLC is a world leading animal genetics company. We breed in better pigs and cattle so farmers can produce high quality meat and milk more efficiently and sustainably. Genus has a long history of leadership in research, development and delivering porcine and bovine genetics. And we apply new ideas using gene editing, reproductive biology, and other breeding technologies to improve genetics for sustainable production and healthy and disease-resistant animals. Genus's R&D and ABS, our global bovine business, have headquarters in DeForest, Wisconsin, and PIC, our global porcine business, has headquarters in Nashville, Tennessee. Our firm belief is we need more science to improve animal health and welfare and continue America's leadership in meeting global protein demand. Additionally, as climate change and zoonotic diseases present even greater risk today to animal and human health and to our economy, more science is urgently needed to find mitigating solutions. I appreciate the opportunity to appear today because the innovative work being done by Genos and others in the biotechnology and livestock industry is so critical. Due to science and technology, we see livestock genetics, along with industry practices, reducing animals' carbon footprint. For example, the amount of feed needed for a pig to be build body weight has fallen by nearly 60% over the last 50 years. In dairy, 13% fewer cows today, producing 76% more milk. Put simply, the animal footprint in the United States is going down. And in large part, this is due to improved knowledge and application of innovative animal practices, science, and technology. Beyond these benefits, we see even greater opportunity in the prevention of disease. Through Genesis gene editing program, we have an opportunity today to eradicate porcine reproductive and respiratory syndrome, or PERS virus. PERS is a global endemic disease which causes animal death and suffering, which impacts the livelihood of all farmers. We're excited to share that through small deletion in one gene and not a single addition to the pig genome, in our research trials, PERS resistant pigs showed complete resistance, and I mean 100% resistance, to the PERS virus. The product is currently going through regulatory review by the FDA. As this committee notes in your letter to USDA and FDA, an efficient risk and science-based regulatory system is imperative to capitalizing on this solution, and we agree. For Genus, our ethical commitments guide our efforts, including our commitment to partner and comply with all global government regulations, including testing and safety requirements. However, to bring these solutions to commercial reality, we need practical, less expensive, risk and science-based regulatory system that provides safe and predictable path to market. We believe a fit-for-purpose regulatory framework for animals should create certainty for innovators, investors, producers, and consumers. And it should be practical, in allowing the benefits of the technology to be efficiently and safely realized, while at the same time cementing the US as a pioneer in innovation in this sector. We also need a coordinated global regulatory framework to avoid trade disruption and allowing producers and farmers to embrace these solutions. In closing, as we look to the future, we truly believe new technologies can lead to eradication of animal diseases, provide the opportunity for less use of antibiotics, produce more protein from fewer animals, resulting to less environmental impact. If these innovations are stifled, society will miss out on huge solutions for improving the sustainability of our food system. Thank you. I look forward to your questions. I want to thank you, uh, Dr. Rice, for your uh, concise uh, testimony, informative testimony. 
uh, and both witnesses for staying within the timeline. That's uh, always uh, appreciated. Uh, I now uh, defer to uh, our subcommittee chair, uh, Chairwoman Plaskett, to uh, introduce our third uh, panel member, uh, subcommittee chairman uh, Plaskett. Uh, floor Thank is yours. you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, our third witness today is Mr. Jack Bobo, who is the chief executive officer of Corturity. Thank you so much, Mr. Bobo, for being a part of the hearing today and for sharing your expertise and knowledge uh, and supporting the work of our, of our subcommittees. Thank you, and you have five minutes now. Uh, th good morning. Thank you, Chairwoman Plaskett, Chair, uh, Chairman Costa, Ranking Member Baird, Ranking Member Johnson, and members of the subcommittee for having me here today. Um, as was mentioned, I'm Jack Bobo, the CEO of Futurity, a food foresight company. Uh, however, I previously served for four years as the Chief Communications Officer for Intrexon Corporation, a synthetic biology company. While you may not be familiar with the Intrexon name, you're likely familiar with some of the company's products, which included the non-browning Arctic apple, genetically engine engineered mosquitoes, animal clones. Uh, I also served on the board of Aqua Bounty Technologies. Uh, before that, I served for 12 years with the U.S. Department of State as the Senior Advisor for Global Biotechnology under four secretaries and during two administrations. Um, I'm pleased to be here today to talk about uh, agricultural biotechnology, 21st century advancements and applications. There can be no more important topic than the future of agriculture because the future of the planet depends on the food we eat and the choices we make about that food over the next three decades. The impact of agriculture on the planet is enormous in terms of land, water, and climate change. And unfortunately, as was already mentioned, uh, things are gonna get worse before they get better because we need to produce 50 to 60% more food by the year 2050. Transforming the food system to be more sustainable and resilient provides one of the best opportunities to make change for the better. My remarks here today focus on agricultural biotechnology in contributing to a more sustainable, just, and nutritious future, not because it is a silver bullet, but because it's an important tool. Let me share a couple of examples. The most popular fruit in the world today is the banana. However, the most common variety, the Cavendish, is at risk of extinction from plant disease. Biotech research currently underway in the United States and overseas has the potential to save this variety. And it's critical that these products be able to make it to market. They also have impacts on smallholder farmers around the world. Similar benefits will accrue from the deployment of animal biotech products, such as the Aqua Advantage salmon, which would add jobs domestically and reduce US dependence on $3 billion of salmon imports. Globally, the picture is quite diverse. We see some countries forging ahead with deployment of genetically engineered and gene edited products, while others continue to put in place regulatory barriers to adoption. In Asia, Japan has traditionally taken a cautious approach to ag biotech. However, the country took a great leap forward this year with the placing on the market of the first plant and animal gene edited products, a tomato with a healthier nutrient profile and a meatier fish. Japanese regulations allow such products to be marketed without the regulatory hoops required of a genetically engineered food product, though they must be registered with the Ministry of Health. Unfortunately, consumer acceptance of ag biotech continues to lag behind the global consensus among regulators in the safety of products currently on the market, as well as confidence in the technology from the scientific community. The United States has long held a comfortable lead in the development and application of new biotech products, but that leadership is now in doubt. This can be seen in the recent advances in Japan in the case of gene editing. It is also on display in other areas of food technology, such as cell cultured and cell cultivated meat with governments in Singapore and Israel, giving the green light to products ahead of US regulatory agencies, despite the long history uh, and the long lead time in terms of technology development here in the United States. In conclusion, innovation is the only way to produce 50% more food using less land and water and while re dramatically reducing emissions. Agriculture has a long history of reducing impact while increasing output. In order to see even greater gains over the next 30 years, 
we must prioritize investments in agriculture and development of policies that promote more sustainable outcomes. This will ensure that the United States remains the global leader in technology development and most importantly, provides leadership to the rest of the world to follow suit. Thank you for providing me the opportunity to discuss this critical topic. I look forward to the questions. Thank you very much, <clears throat> Mr. Bo Bobo. Uh, our fourth uh, witness that will complete our panel and we'll begin the uh, five minutes for each member for questions and comments is Dr. Uh, John Oatley, who is the Associate Dean of Research and the Professor of the School of um, Molecular Biosciences and Directular and Funcio Functional Genomics Initiative, uh, College of Veterinary Medicine at Washington State University. Um, uh, Dr. Um, Oatley, uh, that's a mouthful. <laughs> Uh, but uh, clearly, uh, Washington State is a, one of our premier universities in the country, and uh, your leadership as the Associate Dean is uh, well-respected, and we look forward to hearing your comments. Good morning, Chairman Costa, Chairwoman Plaskett, Ranking Members Johnson, Baird, and Thompson, Congresswoman Trier from Washington State, and other members of the subcommittees. My name is John Oatley. I am the Associate Dean of Research and a professor in the College of Veterinary Medicine at Washington State University. My testimony will reflect how I see the current state of biotechnology in animal agriculture, in particular, the potential for gene editing technologies to improve how the human population is fed now and in the coming decades. The lens I see this area through has been shaped by an array of experiences. Beyond serving as a research administrator for a tier one land grant university, I'm also a scientist working at the ground level to develop gene editing applications in farm animals. I've also gained an academician's perspective on early stage navigation of the current federal regulatory approval process for biotechnology in animals. And I served as a member of the recent task force on gene editing in livestock that was established by the American Association of veterinary medical colleges and association of public and land grant universities. As has been mentioned several times already, food security is a global issue. At present, nearly 1 billion people are malnourished and in starvation conditions. And based on historic trend, the human population is estimated to reach 10 billion by the year 2050. That's a 28% increase from where we are today. Although opinions vary, most scientists agree that a significant increase somewhere in the neighborhood of 60% will be needed in agricultural production, both plant and animal. And that's just to maintain today's nutritional standards for feeding the future in 2050. The farm animal of the future will need to be more efficient in converting inputs such as feed and water into outputs for human consumption. And it will need to do this in increasingly harsher environments while having less impact on the climate. We will need to tailor food animals for feeding more with less. And now is the time to start the process, not years from now. Humans have been engineering the genome of domesticated animals for thousands of years by way of selective breeding. But it's really the last 10 years of scientific discovery that have been a game changer through advent of gene editing as a molecular tool for precision genome engineering and creating dramatic positive impact on production traits. We are already starting to see applications be advanced from the research lab into commercial channels, including strategies to make PERS resistant pigs that were developed by scientists at the University of Missouri and the Roslyn Institute, and surrogate sires breeding technology that was developed at Washington State University that is designed to amplify the impact of desirable or elite genetics across the spectrum of livestock production. Global adoption of innovation for producing agricultural animals can significantly strengthen the food supply and positively impact economic prosperity. Applications of gene editing to enhance traits is the present and the future of innovation in livestock production. For the promises to be realized in feeding the future, processes for federal regulatory approval and monitoring must be rooted in science and aligned to the pace of development. The current US federal regulatory framework that governs process of intentional genetic alteration of animals was designed for molecular technologies of more than three decades ago and is not well aligned with state of the art for gene editing. A modernization is needed that likely includes re-envisioning of agencies that approve and monitor applications in food animals. 
To this end, I believe the advance notice of proposed rulemaking on the regulation of animals developed by genetic engineering that was released by the USDA in 2020 and the MOU created in 2021 by officials of the USDA and HHS that calls for collaboration between the FDA and USDA in establishing a coordinated framework to assess genetic alteration of food animals and streamline the approval and monitoring processes are both steps in the right direction. I urge Congress to consider modernizing federal regulatory framework for gene editing in food animals and to be judicious with enacting it. We have the tools at our disposal for designing the farm animal of the future that will feed more with less. We now need a federal regulatory landscape that is conducive for making material gains in advancing discoveries from laboratory to the public domain. I'd like to close by paraphrasing a quote from George Washington that was written in a letter in 1794. I know of no pursuit in which more real and important services can be rendered to any country than by improving its agriculture and its breeding of useful animals. A statement was relevant 227 years ago, and I believe it still rings true today in guiding the next frontier of animal agriculture. And that will undoubtedly involve applications of gene editing. Thank you for the opportunity to testify for this panel, and I would be glad to try to address any questions. Thank you, Dr. Oatley, <clears throat> for that uh, uh, informative testimony. And I think uh, George Washington, Pre President George Washington was, <clears throat> was uh, uh, correct in his observation then, and I think it's, uh, it's instructive for us today. Um, now we are at that opportunity, uh, having the panel um, completed the testimony, where members will be recognized uh, for uh, any questions or comments they wish to make in order of seniority alternating between the majority and minority members, um, both between the uh, Subcommittee on Livestock, Foreign Agriculture and the Subcommittee that Biotechnology, Horticulture and Research Subcommittees. And I wanna once again, thank our Subcommittee Chairman, uh, Stacy Plaskett for her graciousness and her uh, efforts with her staff to, uh, um, in a very challenging sort of way, pull together these two subcommittees for this joint hearing um, uh, in a completely um, Zoom environment. Uh, this is not hybrid, it's uh, all obviously uh, uh, virtual, but um, uh, realizing that uh, I will um, as best as I know, and please for all the members that are participating, please let your staff know um, to the, um, our, our subcommittee staff, uh, uh, I will recognize you in the order that the staff passes me the cards that in terms of the time that you've been there trying to recognize uh, majority and minority members on an alternating basis. <clears throat> and again, uh, the um, uh, suggestion that we be careful about having our <clears throat> mics muted when we're not uh, uh, having our five minutes to ask our questions. With that said, <clears throat> I will recognize myself for five minutes uh, and let me begin. Uh, Mr. Bobo, you talked about how biotechnology can help solve environmental problems in my home state of California with the strong environmental ethic. Uh, we've seen the challenges both in droughts and fires as a matter of in fact, we say we don't know, no longer have a fire season, we have a fire year. What can be done to help improve crops uh, given the extreme drought conditions we're facing in the West and other parts of the world? Um, would you please comment? Uh, yes, I will. And I'm sure that uh, Dr. Finley Cho has a lot to say on this as well. Uh, but I think certainly drought tolerance is something that, you know, we need to begin breeding in. Well, we have been breeding in, but needs to be more of a focus. Uh, we need to not ensure that it doesn't have any kind of a yield drag because it's not enough that we're able to create crops that are good when years are bad, but we're they also to have to more with less, right? <laughs> Yes, and they have to be able to perform when um, you know conditions are good as well under the drought conditions. And so I think that you know there needs to be an effort on that. But also uh, in terms of it's not just the biotechnology, but it's also in the agricultural practices to ensure load, uh, you know, uh, minimal drip and irrigation and other things. So it's going to well, be a combination. And we've done a lot of that uh, in many parts of American agriculture. Dr. Fadley, Chad, do you have anything to add to that? 
Sure. I, uh, I was just in California a few weeks ago and, and just talked to some of the farmers on the ground. I think you know, from my, our perspective at ASTA, seed is one thing you cannot replace. Right? No matter whether you are going to have better fertilizers or better water use, you have to start with the seed. So for the genetics of that seed to be able to germinate under drought conditions or under less water conditions is super important. And once that seed germinates in a plant, how it uses water efficiently is very, very important. There's lots of research that's happening at UC Davis on lettuce, which is grown very widely in California and which I think every single one of us probably eats every day, or if we don't, we should. Um, so I think there is a lot of research in that. There's drought resistant wheat research being working on and rice. So there's lots of excitement around this because water is one of the most um, both limited and expensive inputs if we're talking about California into agriculture and how we can limit that is this very would be useful not just for um, agriculture but across the board. And I think too as you're thinking about you know increased precision of water usage, increased precision of um, herbicide or um, fertilizer, plant breeding and plant genetics can help with that, right? So you yeah, have to start on that with point, the, um, the the partnership uh, you talked about UC Davis, which is one of the premier land grant universities in the country and on ag science. How do we best utilize the public private partnerships uh, today from a, uh, a standpoint of innovation? So for public and private, it's the foundation of US agriculture. It's been around for a long time. The public universities take on fundamental research. It trains our scientists. It trains the next generation workforce. The private sector takes on the burden of the long regulatory process, the long process of uh, investment, of financial burden to take a very promising product to the commercial space. And they have the resources, both financial and long-term horizon to do that. Universities do not have that time to do that. Correct. And, and I would like money to talk, comes... talk to you more about that in terms of the timeline. My time's expiring, so I want to make sure I get my questions in here. Um, Mr. Bobo, uh, we talked about phytosanitary standards and both uh, Mr. Johnson and I commented upon a, a level playing field. Uh, the farm to fork strategy that we see in Euro Europe, uh, which I think is, uh, is uh, has important goals, but is it well thought out and, and its application uh, around the world and possibly here in the United States, I would like to get your thoughts. So the farm to fork strategy is focusing on reducing the impacts of agriculture, which means that they're going to be producing less food in Europe. Um, as a result, they're going to be exporting their agricultural footprint to the rest of the world. The country that sends the most food to Europe right now is Brazil, the largest deforester on the planet. So that's going to create challenges for the rest of the world. In some respects, it's an opportunity for the United States, because if they can't produce the food themselves, somebody else has to produce it. Um, but it's actually challenging for the rest of the world if Europe, one of the largest producers, chooses low, uh, low productivity um, in a world in which we actually need to be producing more food. Well, thank you. Um, and um, I would like to, uh, Mr. Oatley, you talked about gene editing and uh, pro provide more food with less inputs. Uh, you want to uh, be tell us where the, the, the I mean, we've got same-sex semen, we've got genetics and dairy that are allowing us to produce more lactates and, and, and nutritional uh, uh, nutrition portions of milk products uh, that we've never seen before. Uh, my time's expired, but I'd like you to comment on that at a later date, if you can think about that. And I wanna to defer now to, the, uh, to my ranking member, uh, Representative uh, Johnson from South Dakota. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I suspect all of our panelists know that Mexico recently published a decree announcing their intention to phase out a number of different important agricultural technologies. And included in that, uh, in, that, in, that, in that announcement was that they wanted imports of biotech corn for human consumption to be eliminated in Mexico by 2024. This is in uh, contravention of the bulk of scientific evidence and it's in violation of USMCA. And, and we're seeing more and more of this kind of uh, maybe protectionist or maybe overly cautious approach toward uh, innovation and technology. So we've got a mixed panel here. So for folks who know a lot about crops, I want uh, specifically for them to share with us what Congress should do 
uh, given this threat from Mexico. And then for the folks who know more about livestock, tell us to what extent we're seeing similar behavior in the international marketplace on the livestock and animal side and what Congress should do about that. Let's go in the order of the uh, presenters who spoke. So uh, Fan Li Chow, uh, you are first. Thank you, Congressman Johnson. I think the USMCA actually has a chapter on agricultural biotechnology that is not just plant focused, even though most of our trade right now is in plants, but it, it can be used across the board. So I think it's really important for us to enforce that chapter. It creates a mechanism to settle trade disruptions. It creates a mechanism to minimize trade disruptions. And it also creates a mechanism for us to talk about the future technologies that we're gonna be using agriculture. So we're, it's both current looking and forward looking. So I think it's really important for this administration to really use that um, biotechnology text because it is actually the first time that we had a biotech text in a trade agreement. And I think it sets great precedent for us to use that in other forums as well. I think it's very short-sighted of Mexico. We are all not, it's global climate change. It's a global climate change, not a US climate change. They need to produce food. We need to produce food. And you don't want to cut off your arm just to do things with one hand tied behind your back. Um, but I think as we look forward to gene editing, there's an opportunity that we are all across the world looking at. Many governments are taking their GMO position and rethinking it in light of gene editing because it is working within the plant's own genetic resources and own genetic gene pool. So I'm hopeful that Mexico will take a look at that and really rethink how they look at the future of the 21st century and not look backwards. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Ms. Rice? Thank you. Um, Mexico is a key uh, market for our pork producers. And as we investing um, a lot into purse resistant pigs today, we're facing very uncertain future for this uh, very important product to come to the market because if our producers cannot export pork to Mexico, that will close door for this important product. And uh, Saying that, we also know, because we had a lot of conversations with pork producers in Mexico, that they are very interested in this very critical trade for them. They are facing a lot of diseases, just like every producers everywhere else. And um, this inability for us or uncertainty with Mexico really create significant barrier for all uh, trades that we can bring to our producers. So having our government to work on uh, trade uh, agreements with Mexico is absolutely critical. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Bobo, uh, about 45 seconds and then Dr. Oatley after that. Sure, uh, Dr. Chow already spoke to the regulatory aspects. I think I would just add that there's also uh, the human impact on uh, in terms of food security, this is going to dramatically increase the cost of food in Mexico. Um, but it also, there aren't a lot of other markets for that corn that are not biotech. And so if they're going to produce dramatically more corn in Mexico, it's going to be with more modern varieties, which is going to eliminate a lot of the land races that are in Mexico, which are traditional. And so it's actually going to have an impact on sort of the global center of biodiversity for maize to move in this direction. So there's both an environmental impact, a long-term consequence of food security and uh, current hunger that I think we'll see you know, rise out of this decision. Thank you. Dr. Oatley. I agree with everything that's been said so far. I just wanna reiterate one point and that's on the animal side at least, a lot of the gene editing changes that are being made to the genome of animals can and, and likely do arise in nature at some level. And I think that needs to be taken into account when we're talking about regulation of trade of animal biotechnology products um, amongst countries. Yeah, I think that's all very well said. Thank you to the panelists. And this is a serious threat and we wanna work with the global community to make sure we get this right. Too much is at stake environmentally, too much is at stake from a hunger perspective. Uh, we need American leadership more now than ever. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I yield back. Mr. Chairman, you are muted. I thank the uh, gentleman from South Dakota, and now it's the chair's uh, pleasure to recognize the subcommittee chair from the U.S. Virgins, uh, uh, Chair Stacy Plaska. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and thank you again to the witnesses who are here with us. Um, this is a question that's directed to Mr. Bobo. Uh, just want to know, are there reasons to be cautious or to be optimistic 
in using agricultural biotechnology as a tool to advance climate change adaption and mitigation in plant and animal agriculture. So I want to know your thoughts on this topic. Well, in terms of the science, I, I'm actually dramatically hopeful. Uh, if we were farming today with 1960s technology, we would need 1 billion additional hectares of land in order to produce the food we do, which is more than a quarter of all the forest on the planet. So innovation has saved more forests than it had, and then agriculture has um, led to the destruction of. Uh, I think that it's not a question of can we do it? It's a question of will we choose to do it? Science tells us what we can do, but the public tells us what we should do. And therefore it's critical that there's transparency and engagement with the public so that they have trust in the companies that are developing these technologies so they will allow us to bring them to market. Thank you. You talk about these, um, what science is doing and the research and the work that is really advancing at a rapid rate. Does the US regulatory system guide or inhibit innovation in agricultural biotechnology? And what improvements, is, if any, should there be made to support innovation while at the same time um, reacting to positively and responsibly to the concerns of people as well? And that's for any of the witnesses. Uh, yeah, I can begin. Uh... Certainly, I think the, the US regulatory system is recognized around the world as being a, a leader. Uh, however, I do think that we need to ensure that the, uh, the level of regulation is consistent with the threat that's actually there or the risk that's there. And with many of these technologies, the technologies, the risk is not actually much higher than with traditional breeding. And in many cases, it's exactly the same or even less. And so we need to ensure that there's that balance between uh, actual risk and then there, there are trade-offs between the choices that we make. If we choose not to apply these technologies, then we will be living with the consequences of uh, you know, increased climate change, increased hunger, and other things. And so we, we really need to keep those in check. And you know, finally, the United States could be doing a lot more. Uh, much of this has to come down to political will that the regulations, uh, you know, if there's political will, you can move more quickly. Europe's regulations are not all that different than the United States. There's just a lack of political will that allows products to come out the other end of the regulatory system. Thank you. Are there anything, um, Mr. Oatley, Ms. Um, Chow, that you'd like to add? Yeah, I, I'd like to add that um, the federal regulatory framework that exists now is not necessarily a hindrance, it's just it was created for technologies that were developed several decades ago. Um, and gene editing is quite different than conventional transgenesis that uses recombinant DNA. And so I think um, a moderniz modernization is needed in order to speed up a uh, process for assessment as well as monitoring. I think many in the academic world view it as glacial and somewhat ambiguous at the moment. And I think that needs to be improved on as we are developing some of these gene editing applications that again, can and do arise in nature and are somewhat more precise than kind of a messy system that is selective breeding. Um, and so I think those things need to be taken into account as we're looking to modernize um, what the federal regulatory landscape looks like. Thank you, you talked about gene editing. Ms. Chow, um, can you talk at the University of the Virgin Islands um, we're doing research in biotechnology application and traditional um, Caribbean crops. You just, you, um, Mr. Oatley just talked about gene editing solutions. Um, are any emerging technology or gene editing solutions related to staple or specialty crops like these? Uh, is any of that work being done that you're aware of? Yeah, so this is the exciting thing about gene editing in plants is that it's applicable across all crops. Variety. So we're doing, there's lots of work being happening in fruits and vegetables, in cassava, uh, in African countries. This is, it's, it's a subsistence, sorry, can't say that word, um, crop. And I think that's the excitement. You know, I was a research scientist and the speed of science seems really fast, but it's quite slow. I'm sure Dr. Oli has been working on his project for years and years. And gene editing and plant breeding has been occurring for years and years. So the speed of regulation seems to be even slower. And we need to kind of speed that up a little bit so that you know, as the science advancements are getting ready to commercialization, that the regulatory processes are there to meet it. Thank you. Thank you so much. My time has um, expired. I want to thank you, um, my fellow chair, 
um, for this opportunity. And you know, as I'm hearing these questions and these answers, yes, there is regulatory work that we need to do on our end, but we really do rely on all of you as witnesses and the um, and the industry to make it uh, the information that you're doing, the gene editing palatable and such that the layman can understand um, so that our constituency and others are not afraid of what's happening, that they have comfort in the work that you're doing that will then give us some leeway to be able to support your work as well. Thank you. Well, I, th I thank the uh, chairwoman and I think your point is well taken and um, in my own conversations with our counterparts within the European Union and members of the European Parliament, I think that uh, creating the trust factor um, uh, as we try to meet the demands of a growing world population and understanding that without biotechnology and food and plant science, animal science, that we're not going to be able to do this. Um, and we already know that we have almost a billion people that are malnutritioned and in, in need of good food. So it's a, it's a challenge, and you're correct to point this out. It's more work that we need to do with both subcommittees, I believe. Our next witness, excuse me, our next uh, committee member uh, to be recognized is the uh, ranking member, uh, uh, Mr. Baird, um, who uh, from Indiana, and uh, you'll be recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I really, you know, I, I really appreciate you having, having such knowledgeable witnesses testifying today. And I really enjoy these kinds of uh, these kinds of um, uh, committee meetings. But I'm going to start with Dr. Rice because I'm excited about the work you're doing with PRRS resistant pigs through the gene editing. And I'm only going to select this one just because I think it, it has an impact not only on producers, but it has an impact on consumers. So uh, it's just one example of what we can do to help promote disease resistance. And so. Uh, PRRS is a threat to hog farmers of all sizes. Uh, the disease attacks the pigs' reproductive and respiratory systems, and it makes it difficult for them to breathe and as well as to give birth. And uh, it can devastate an entire herd of a thousand pigs in just two short months. I think African swine fever may be even faster than that, for example. But unfortunately, it cannot be effectively prevented or treated by traditional veterinary medicines or vaccines. So could you talk about Genesis technology on developing disease resistant pigs using this gene editing? Uh, yes, thank you uh, for this question. Um, the research on PERS resistance was done by originally by Missouri State and Roslyn University of Edinburgh. So as a company, we uh, it took the challenge to bring this very important product to the market. So it took us quite a few years to develop the right um, approach, technological approach to make resistance in the pigs. And uh, what I think most importantly, we started our um, interaction with FDA and entered, uh, entered the regulatory process with the FDA uh, last year. Um, the gene editing is really gives us a very simple tool. We're deleting one very small portion of the gene, and as a result of that, virus cannot enter the body of the pigs. So basically, pigs become, um, they don't see the virus anymore. There is nothing, there's no foreign material being inserted in the genome of the pigs. It's really just one small deletion. So pigs continue to grow the same weight. They uh, develop the same way. There's absolutely no other differences except that those pigs cannot get sick from PERS virus. So as we entered into the regulatory process last year, um, we have very good relationship with FDA. We have a lot of discussions. At the same time, the process is very long. Why? Because we need to show and demonstrate uh, different trade, well, confirmed our um, testing across multiple generations of pigs. Because of the life cycle of the animals, it takes quite a few years. So we assume it would be at least five years before we can bring this to the market. 
So, so has this been in the process for five years? Is that what I'm understanding? Well, we, we will be finishing all required study by the end of 23, and we hope that we will get uh, approvals in 2024. Okay, super. Uh, so, Dr. Oatley, your uh, veterinary medicine background and so on, you got any thoughts to add to this on disease resistance and how we might use um, gene editing and so on? Thank you for the question. I think gene editing strategies provide an opportunity to create pigs that are resistant to pathogens like PERS, even um, addressing African swine fever. One of the interesting things about African swine fever is that both domestic pigs as well as wild warthogs are hosts for the virus. However, only domestic pigs are susceptible to the disease and, white, and warthogs are asymptomatic. And so there is potential to identify what is unique about the warthog genome that allows them to be resistant to the virus and then use gene editing to engineer that into a domestic pig. So I think those are some of the concepts that can come out for getting disease resistance um, across the spectrum of pathogens um, that infect and harm our livestock. Thank you, and I see I got 12 seconds less. So uh, Dr. Fan Lee Chow, I appreciate uh, you being here, but I can't ask a question and same for you, Dr. Bobo, but uh, I appreciate all your answers. Well, thank, thank you. you. I thank the gentleman from uh, Indiana for his questions. And uh, our next um, member uh, to be recognized is Representative Gahana from AIDS from Connecticut. Uh, you are recognized for five minutes. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for having this very important hearing today. Genetic engineering is woven throughout Connecticut agriculture and agricultural research. Yukon Extension, which is in my district, was among the first in the world to clone animals and have an active hemp and cannabis genetic program. Connecticut dairy farmers use genetically modified corn, beet pulp, and soybeans for livestock feed and feed rations. Another area of genetic engineering research happens in my district as well, and it relates to environmental protection. Yukon Extension is researching how they can breed plants to be responsive to climate change. So Dr. Chow, can you give me a few examples of how gene editing can lead to climate change mitigation and what applications of biotechnology have proven most effective for addressing climate change in agriculture? Thank you for the question. And let me just say that Climate change is the most pressing issue facing our farmers right now. And it's because of the unpredictability of the climate they have. Like in California, they've been historically dealing with a drought, but then just recently they had a huge bunch of rain. So it is difficult for farmers to adjust to that. I think plant breeding has a lot to contribute to climate change, both from adaptive perspective and also from a mitigation perspective. On the adaptive perspective, we can breed plants that can adapt to drought conditions that, or to high water conditions. Right? From the mitigation perspective, there are scientists that's working on making plants with stronger roots that can sequester carbon for longer. They are creating plants, new cover crops that farmers can plant when the fields are fallow to keep the soil healthy. But instead of just having a non-economic crop, these oil seeds are now gene edited so it is, can be fed to animals. And that creates a cash crop for the farmers. So we at the plant, research um, community is really excited about these kind of things that could occur. But I think for us, it's not just about climate adaptation and climate mitigation. It's all about creating food and making food and making that food nutritious and tasty for consumers across the board, right? So we are also working on nutrition security. So berries is something that everybody likes. I have two small children, but they don't last very long in my fridge. So just thinking about making berries more available and more um, shelf friendly, shelf stay fresh longer for consumers that will have tremendous benefit from a nutritional perspective for us and for the value chain. So you can stay on mark, uh, market shelves longer. So these are the things that are, that are really important. And I think the last thing I wanna mention is food waste, right? So I have little kids, every time I cut an apple, if it's brown, they won't eat it. There is nothing wrong with that apple, right? It tastes fine. So there's a lot of work working on non-browning apples, non-browning potatoes, 
non-browning lettuce. So it's not about just producing enough food, but also like using the food that we're producing and not wasting it. Because every time we waste food, we're wasting resources, we're wasting water, we're wasting labor, we're wasting gas. So I think those across the board are all the things that we need to do from a climate-friendly perspective in agriculture. Uh, would well, the gentleman you. yield? Uh, yes, yes, Mr. Chair. Just a quick question. Uh, how much food is estimated that we waste in the United States each year? I don't have that uh, figure off the top of my head, um, but I would think it's, so for potatoes, it was, the, there's um, studies that demonstrate if we can just have non-browning potatoes, we will save 1.5 billion pounds of potatoes a year. That's a lot of French fries. <laughs> So I think if you take that across apples and lettuce, like just think about all the lettuce we throw away when it gets brown and we don't finish it by the end of the week. It's a, it's a lot. And that's just in our, in our kitchens. Thank you, Dr. Chow. I can tell you that you have made my colleague, Representative Schreier, Dr. Schreier, very happy because this is something that she talks about often. Um, I just have one follow-up question. Even with these exciting developments, I've also heard concerns that gene editing may drive reliance on environmentally detrimental herbicides. How do you believe we should balance our efforts with climate change mitigation uh, with those concerns? I think if you look at the research that's happening right now on how gene editing is used in crop species and even in animals, it's broader than just herbicide use. We're talking about nutrition, we're talking about water usage, we're talking about things that would allow us to use less inputs. So I think we have to think broadly and not think about how we use agricultural biotechnology, the 20th century agricultural biotechnology, but thinking more ahead in the 21st century. As we're learning more about plants, we're getting more precise about how we are doing things. And I think that creates a lot of opportunities. So at ASTA, we actually have a website called Innovature that talks about food. It doesn't talk about agriculture, it talks about food and how plant breeding impacts our lives, both from an environmental perspective, but a health perspective. So I really encourage you all to take a look at that because it is, it's, a, it, it's very appealing for those, I, I did not start in ag, so I think it's targeted at folks that are not in ag, which really need to understand and appreciate all the efforts we all put into agriculture. Thank you so much for being here today and for working with us on sustainable agriculture as we look for ways to address food insecurity. That's something that's big for me. So thank you very much for your work in this area. Mr. Chair, with that, I yield back. Well, thank you uh, very much, uh, Representative Hayes, for your good questions and for yielding. Uh, I appreciate that. Uh, I had committee staff just send me some numbers that uh, the amount of food that is wasted in the United States um, is uh, in excess of, depending upon the different products we're talking about, in excess of 30%. It's a, a very significant number and we've got to figure out a better way to do deal with that uh, waste issue. Um, uh, the next uh, representative that uh, staff has put before me, and, and that's the order I'm going on, uh, is Representative uh, Crawford uh, from Arkansas. Uh, Representative uh, Crawford, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate appreciate the hearing and to the presenters. And, and I'll throw this out there just to anybody that might want to address this topic. Uh, Dr. Baird alluded to this earlier in, in his um, questioning. African swine fever is a significant threat to our food supply, our economy, and our environment. And it was recently detected in the Caribbean has also caused the loss of more than 7 million pigs in Asia, Africa, and Europe. I just wondering if anyone wants to comment on um, biotech research specific to this disease. What are the prospects of using biotech to protect the nation's swine industry as it applies to African swine fever? As I, as I mentioned to uh, Mr. Baird about the warthog being a host for the virus, but resistant to the virus, whereas the domestic pig is susceptible to the virus. There's been some research in trying to understand what is unique about the warthog that allows it to be resistant and hopefully find the genetics that drive that trait and engineer that using gene editing into domestic pigs. Um, I think it's at the very beginning stages of, of concept from a research and development standpoint, but I think um, applications like that hold great promise for us to be able to, to address 
big problems like African swine fever. Um, what about um, biotech that can be used to develop, um, I, I guess, reduce the need for, for antibiotics? I, you know, antibiotics are, are, are continue to be a controversial topic um, as it applies to animal agriculture. Any comments on that? Yeah, I, I can comment on that as well. Um, we heard about gene edited pigs that are resistant to porcine reproduction and respiratory syndrome virus. And I think those are likely closest to the public domain. Um, if those were in a production setting, there would be less use of antibiotics. Another example is gene editing strategies to make cattle resistant to bovine respiratory disease. One of the major um, disease problems in feedlot cattle. Um, considering that one of the causative agents of the disease is bovine coronavirus, I think that studying a disease like bovine respiratory disease um, and the viruses that cause it um, and devising ways to make cattle resistant to it, would sure, we'd surely learn more about coronaviruses in general. Um, and that may be a public win for solving COVID-19 or future pandemics as well. So somewhat related to antibiotic use, but um, studying disease resistance to livestock, I think can be a win-win for the public. And, and research going on addressing BSC and FMD and others? Yeah, I'm not as familiar with uh, where the state of the art is for those diseases, but um, perhaps others on the panel know more. Yeah, I can, I can add a few words here. So there is research that we proactively engage in and on, for example, such diseases as influenza, as well as ASF and in cattle BRD. And all these diseases, the, prob the biggest problem that producers have to treat uh, sick animals and uh, very often antibiotics used as a preventive measure from secondary effects that caused by the virus. So it's not directed at the virus, but more on the secondary effects. If we, and we showed in our research on PERS, if we can prevent the, um, the key reason for animal get sick, uh, being impacted, infected by virus, then the use of antibiotics in general will significantly go down. Um, let me switch gears a little bit. I'm, I'm concerned about China and Mexico not fulfilling their biotech trade obligations under the China Phase One Agreement and USMCA, respectively, and and you know, quite frankly, I have some questions on whether the administration is doing anything to address the problem. But uh, I'm just wondering what impacts um, this might have, this flagrant disregard for established trade obligations. What impacts that might have on future research and development in the biotechnology space? Congressman Crawford, if you allow me, I think for the research sure. and research space. You know, we're going to go on doing research. Science is going to move on in the U.S., but from a trade perspective, it has a huge chilling effect. And the seed industry is global in nature. We talk about seed movement. So as seed is getting uh, breed and up increase from foundational seed to commercial seed, it moves across the world many times because of seasonality and also because of the kind of labor we need for, for making and developing seeds. And then when our customers grow these seeds, the products that they produce moves across the world. So as other countries are taking on an anti-science approach in the regulation, it is not a uh, good situation for, I think, USD producers or US food producers everywhere. I think from my perspective, from our perspective, the USMCA and the China phase, agree phase one agreement has very strong language about biotechnology and science-based, risk-based uh, regulation across the board that is consistent with international standards. So I think we need to enforce those. But from China's perspective, they just put out their five-year strategic plan. And in that plan, they made a specific point that they are going to modernize their seed system in China. I think it would be really, if they cannot achieve that goal without using technology. So my expectation is that in the future, the world, regardless where you are, cannot move forward without really taking on agricultural biotechnology like gene editing on board. And if you look at China's research strategy, they are spending a lot of money on gene editing. So we need to be prepared to be as competitive as we can from a research perspective, but also from an economic perspective. We thank you for your, your comments and um, the time has expired, but uh, uh, the chair will now recognize the uh, gentlewoman from Washington State and she has one of her own 
the University uh, Associate Professors who's on our panel and we're pleased to represent, uh, uh, recognize Representative Kim Schreier for your five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Costa. Thank you, Chairwoman Plaskett, for holding this important hearing. And first, I want to take a moment to acknowledge Dr. John Oatley from Washington State University in my home state. Thank you for being here. And thank you so much for your invaluable work and taking the time to appear before my colleagues and me this morning. Um, speaking of Washington State University, I want to highlight a terrific example of the results of innovative agriculture research and biotech happening in my district, um, otherwise known as the apple capital of the world. Uh, more than 20 years ago, Washington State University's apple breeding program first started developing the Cosmic Crisp Apple to be a perfect balance of taste, texture, and usability. And in 2019, these apples first became available for purchase in grocery stores around the country. It was a much awaited event. Uh, today, WSU has planted 17 million Cosmic Crisp trees, all in modern high density trellising with a focus on the future of possible machine harvesting. Now this apple was bred to have high acidity levels and sugar content that preserves the taste throughout harvest, storage, packing, shipping, and sale. And Cosmic Crisps can stay fresh for a whole year in storage, leading to minimal waste in packing houses. They also don't brown when cut. We've been talking about not browning. This revolutionizes school lunches, after school snacks, fruit salads, um, and, and it further reduces food waste, uh, which we've already heard uh, has a very detrimental effect uh, on the environment in, the, in terms of methane. Um, Cosmic Crisps crisp are also also relatively easy to grow compared to other apples because they don't have a lot of physiological vulnerabilities. And these unique characteristics minimize environmental impacts and ensure orchard sustainability, exactly what biotech innovation should seek to achieve. Um, Dr. Chow, in your testimony, you mentioned research being done to develop heat tolerance in lettuce. And as I'm sure you know, the Pacific Northwest was hit with a record-breaking heat wave this summer that dramatically impacted agricultural yield and quality. Can you tell us a little bit more about this research and other innovative work uh, done being to help farmers and ranchers and maybe um, even whether that same type of engineering could extend to other crops like blueberries um, and even maybe touch on heat drought and wildfire smoke? Sure, thank you. And I, I did want to pull up, put a plug in for our conservation side of the AFTA members. So for any time there is after a wildfire and you need to replant that, our, our members provide the, the seedlings and the seed to do that. So every time we you know, make a new highway and there is this on the side highway, you can see wildflowers or grass, that's our members. So, so we don't just do fruits and veg and soy and cotton. We do all sorts of things. So I just want to give them a shout out on that. Thank I you. think for um, drought resistant, it's a, it's a very interesting topic because there are two things that need to happen. When a seed goes into the ground, the conditions, the water conditions has to be right for the seed to sprout. And then once the seed sprouted, the, drought, the conditions have to be right for the, for the plant to grow. And the plant sweats, I would say, just like we do. So it opens its pores and closes its pores depending on, on weather condition. And, and scientists are looking at that to see whether they can control that opening and closing of their sweat pores, if you will, so to, to decrease water loss. And Innovature, the website I keep talking about, actually has a really interesting story about lettuce because the plant scientist, she was driving around and there was an abandoned gas station and there was a wild lettuce that was growing in the cracks. And she was like, this is not getting water, how is it grown? So she took it back to the lab and there she discovered how it was able to germinate and produce. So now they're trying to move that gene or that modification into lettuce that we eat. So it's nutritionally and it tastes better. I'm sure wild lettuce does not taste very good. So this is kind of, this is science, right? 90, 95% perspiration, 5% inspiration. Um, but science doesn't happen so quickly. Like these scientists have been working on drought resistant lettuce at UC Davis for 25 years. So gene editing just allow us to make it more efficient and more accurate and more effective. It doesn't change the fundamentals of science. It does not change the fundamentals of plant breeding, of making sure that that variety is performing as they need it throughout the year. So before anything hits our market, there are so much kind of quality control that goes into it before it comes. Like the cosmic apple, it did not happen overnight, 
right? And trees takes a long time, but the, the farmers have to make sure that everything is performing adequately before it reaches the consumer. So there's lots of layers of that. So I would really encourage you to check out the Innovature website to learn more about um, drought tolerance that is. Thank you very much. And I just have to add in a little joking way, inspiration, perspiration, and then transpiration. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much, Representative Schreier, and uh, thank you for our response to our members' questions. Um, the uh, next um, uh, member that I have uh, before me is uh, Ranking Member Thompson from Pennsylvania, and then uh, that is followed by uh, Representative uh, Rush from um, Illinois. So uh, Representative uh, Thompson, you're recognized for five thank minutes. You. Chairman, thank you so much uh, for a great hearing. Uh, I've seen reports in recent years that FDA's cumbersome approach to regulating animal biotechnology is forcing US academics and developers to consider moving research or commercialization of the product to international markets. Uh, uh, I have a significant concern with that. Uh, Dr. Oatley, have you heard these sorts of concerns or seen these sorts of moves among your peers? And if, if so, what are the implications for domestic research development? Uh, and ultimately access to innovation for our U.S. livestock producers? Thank you for the question. Um, to be short, yes. Um, I have heard amongst peers in various conferences on gene editing of food animals that I participate in, discussions with my colleagues in the space, both within the U.S. and outside the U.S. Mm -hmm. There's always discussions about moving R&D as well as commercialization efforts to outside the borders of the US where a regulatory approval and monitoring process may be more streamlined and less costly. Um, my opinion, this is not a good thing for access to innovation by US livestock producers, nor is it a good thing for scientific discovery and innovation. Um, and I think that scientists are going to follow paths of least resistance on developing their ideas through rigorous experimentation. And so if they can do rigorous and trustworthy science where the federal regulation process is more aligned with the pace of development than it is in the US, it's always going to be considered as a potential option. Dr. Oatley, thank you. I certainly concur with your opinion. I will say that whether it's FDA or USDA, you know, uh, United States bureaucrats should be the, the last to deny and to be a barrier to the continued leadership of US agriculture when it comes to science, technology, and innovation. Uh, over the past two administrations, we've seen bipartisan recognition of the importance of modernizing the nation's biotechnology regulatory framework. However, as many of you made clear in your testimony, work remains to ensure these, that our regulations are based in best science and are competitive globally. Now, whether USDA, FDA, or EPA, can any of the panelists give their opinion on particular areas that are in need of regulatory clarity improvement or modernization? And I'll leave that to any of the panelists that would like to respond. I, I can start, go ahead. Uh, I, I was just gonna say, I, you know, absolutely there's a lot of room for improvement. I think in the animal biotech area, you know, in, in particular, uh, also with gene editing, there are absolutely animals that have uh, products that have been introduced in Argentina for approval before they were introduced in the US, even though the technology was developed here uh, because they didn't even know what the regulatory path was in the United States. And that's still unclear a decade after we've been looking at it. And so uh, we definitely need to uh, clarify those paths to market. And the reason we're talking about gene editing is because genetic engineering has been slow, so slow to be able to bring more products to market. The technology is capable of doing much more than we're doing, but the regulatory burden and the cost is so high that we've moved on to new technologies. I think I would like to add that we definitely need to simplify regulations for gene editing where there is no foreign DNA inserted into the genome and changes can occur naturally. Um, we also need to reconsider multiple generational testing. Considering animal life cycle, it takes many years before those studies can be completed. And finally, I think today we still consider modified DNA in the animal as a drug and it's continued to be regulated. I think that provides undue burden on producers and can really limit it 
limit our ability to bring those products to the market. All right, very good. Well, thank you for that. And finally, as some of you may know, just last week, uh, very appreciative this committee passed legislation to support research, uh, research efforts on chronic wasting disease or CWD that impacts all cervids. A uh, highly contagious prion disease affecting cervids across North America and, and, and in my home state of Pennsylvania in particular. I've been heartened by the development of diagnostic tools to detect increased susceptibility and trans, transmissibility of CWD. And with these types of advancement already in the works, do any of the panelists have thoughts about potential of modern genetic tools to improve CWD resilience yeah, specifically, in particular, in elk and deer populations, which is Pennsylvania impact. And, and uh, actually, I would ask if you do to please uh, uh, look forward to talking with you about that or for a written response, because my time has expired. Uh, Chairman, thanks so much. Uh, great job. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. I'm a ranking member, excuse me, uh, but uh, the gentleman from Pennsylvania is always welcome. Um, and our next uh, member is the gentleman with a great deal of experience uh, and expertise from Illinois, uh, Representative Bobby Rush. I want to thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I'm so well pleased, Mr. Chairman, that we're having this critical hearing this morning. As a proud member of the Ag Committee, as well as the Energy and Commerce uh, Committee, uh, I was pleased to join my esteemed colleagues, Chairwoman Plaskett and Ranking Member Barrett earlier this month uh, in sending a letter on this very issue to uh, USDA Secretary Millsack and uh, FDA Acting Commissioner Janet Woodstock. Mr. Chairman, we must ensure that our regulatory framework is able to work seamlessly across agencies and departments to incentivize innovation through, I might add, biotechnology. This is the only way that we will be able to successfully address the challenges like food insecurity and climate change. That leads to my question this morning. Mr. Momo, Momo, Momo and Ms. Dr. Chow, in your testimonies, you both discussed the problem of having limited land and resources for farming. As we increase the use of biotechnology and related innovations in our nation, can you explain what role urban farming can play and how it can be best utilized for the good of our nation? Sure, I think urban farming is, has a, a huge role to play, not just in producing food, but educating our urban population about agriculture. As we've mentioned here before, we, we need science, we need regulation, and we need consumer acceptance. And consumer acceptance comes from understanding. So I keep mentioning I have two little kids. When they started learning, they were still reading Old McDonald. Old McDonald has not changed since I was a child, and farming has changed. They don't have a new Old McDonald that has AI, drones, electronic tractors. They're talking, talking about old McDonald with the red tractor. So I really think we need to change the way we talk about agriculture and talk about food with our urban population as, as early as we can. So urban farming has a role to play in that, in producing food for the urban, urban population, but also as an educational tool. From a plant breeding perspective, urban far farming, if we're talking about indoor ag, has very different criteria than if I was farming in, in the field in California or in Illinois elsewhere. So in that perspective, the genetics of the seed that you put in there has to be specific for urban farms, for indoor ag. And that's where the, the plant breeding comes in, how we can provide genetics. So I can ask uh, Dr. Rice to talk about urban farming from a from a animal perspective and Dr. Oli too. Yeah. Yeah. Dr. Momo, can you address um, yeah, this sure. So I, I would add, in addition to indoor ag, I think community gardens have become have been growing in many communities. And uh, as Dr. Chow said, that I think this gives communities access to fresh fruits and vegetables. It gives them 
access to understanding how our food is produced, which gives them a better understanding of what goes into that and the challenges that go into that. So while it may not be feeding our communities, it's feeding their, their minds in many ways, even more than their bodies. And I think that's, that's critical for uh, regaining that relationship and connection to our food source, uh, but it also diversifies our source of food. And I think that's critical going forward that you know, we need to be thinking about new ways of producing food, not just doing it the same way we've been doing for 200 years. Dr. Chow, in addition to making farming more efficient and reducing food waste, does biotechnology have the potential to lower the cost of fresh fruits and vegetables to make them more affordable? And how specifically would it impact uh, food insecurity in low income communities around the country? Thank you, uh, thank you Congressman Rush for that question. I think a lowering of food insecurity in the low income population of the country is really, really important. And some of that has to do with shelf life. Right? So we have lots of, um, I grew up in an immigrant community. So I'm aware of the lack of supermarkets in some areas. And we, we buy our food from the local bodega, if you will. So to, to stock fresh fruits and vegetables is difficult because every couple of weeks you have to restock because the food doesn't stay fresh like berries or lettuce. So if we can use gene editing and other technology to increase how food can stay fresher for longer, that will allow some of these stores in these neighborhoods to stock shelves, right? So I think that's super important um, from a food security perspective, but also making food more nutritious and more tastier so that we actually eat it. Like we, I can put a vegetable in front of my child, whether she eats it or not, it's a completely different story. So I think that's also important is how we address both from the production perspective, but also from the, con the consumption perspective. We can make strawberries all year round, but if it doesn't taste good, then we're not gonna eat it. If it cannot stay fresh, we're not gonna have it. So those are important things from a food security perspective as well. Thank you, Ms. Chairman, I yield back. Are you a man, Mr. Chairman? Yes, I'm sorry, I was trying to find my mute button. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much, uh, Representative Rush, for your, uh, your question. Uh, the next member that I have uh, before me to be recognized is another gentleman from uh, Illinois, <clears throat> Representative uh, Rodney Davis, for five minutes. Representative Davis. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you to Chairwoman Plaskett and, and also uh, Ranking Member Baird and and even Ranking Member Johnson, I'd like to throw him in there too. Uh, this has been a great, uh, a great opportunity to actually hear from some of the experts in the field. Um, I, I do wanna make sure that we talk about uh, these biotechnology advancements and applications well into the 21st century that have, have been mentioned throughout this entire hearing. And, and as you know, and has been said, research shows that gene editing tools like CRISPR they result in outcomes that could technically be achieved through conventional breeding, which has proved to be a valuable and promising technology in agriculture to enhance the quality and the yields and sustainability of crops. But my question to any of the witnesses right now is whether the, U, whether the federal government or any government around the world, for that matter, should regulate these edited products any differently than their conventionally bred counterparts. Congressman Davis, I really like the way you put that, regulate them any differently. Because all food is regulated, regardless of how it's produced. All food from plant varieties are regulated. We have general food safety. So I think the question that everyone, all governments around the world is answering is whether these products that could have been done through conventional breeding or occur in nature, but we used advanced technologies to do it, whether they should be differentially regulated. And that, oh, that differential regulation is what commonly is termed GMO regulation. And internationally, there is consensus now, growing consensus that these products that could have been done through conventional breeding, but the method to get there was different, does not need to be differentially regulated. So does not need to go through the GMO regulation. So in the US, we don't have such a clear cut GMO in, GMO out. We have three agencies that have their own regulatory triggers and their regu own regulatory policies. 
And then we have all mentioned how important it is for those three agencies, USDA, EPA, and FDA, to be coordinated and consistent in their policy, both from a scoping perspective, but also from an implementation perspective, meaning they need to make timely decisions together, not separately. We cannot wait on one. It's a three-legged stool that we're sitting on here. So as we're looking into the 21st century, USDA had made some progress, EPA has made some progress, and we're waiting for FDA to join the ranks. So I think there can be better coordination and cooperation between the three agencies. Well, thank you. Um, anybody else want to take that on? Yeah, yes, I, I want to add here uh, one thing that today we regulate in technology. I think the right way would be to regulate products. And if products are no different and not outside of what occur naturally, then they should go through minimum um, safety testing and regulatory process. So I think that small change can make a big difference, not to regulate technology, but look at the product. And I would, I would just add on to that, that um, you know, they shouldn't be differentially regulated. However, if different countries do regulate them differently, it is important that governments are aware of the changes and therefore the registry that Japan has um, is useful for governments because we wanna ensure that trade continues to flow as well. Great, hey, thank you all for your responses. Now, one of the priorities of this subcommittee is agriculture research. And how can we better utilize and leverage any existing federal research programs under NIFA, or uh, AFRI and hopefully um, AGARDA also once funded to actually enhance technology and more importantly too, based on my previous question, the public's understanding of it. And also any suggestion any of you want to, to make about how uh, we can you know, kind of let the USDA know what and other regulated agencies, what we expect and what we should expect into the future. I think as a as a university professor, um, maybe I can begin to address that. And I think it probably comes as no surprise to to hear me say that I think research funding in the public sector really is the heart and soul of innovation for biotechnology within the U.S. Uh, many of the basic and most groundbreaking discoveries happen at our land grant universities. I think our research programs live and die based on being or not being awarded extramural funding every year. And so every year conducting research at a university becomes more expensive and competitive and federal funding for biotechnology in the animal space has remained largely stagnant or even reduced. And so being an academic researcher can be quite stressful in not knowing whether you can keep a lab going from year to year and it's becoming more and more of a challenge for faculty to convince the next generation of graduate students who are trying to train to follow in our footsteps and become academic researchers. So in my opinion, I think if the U.S. is going to keep pace with other countries in science and innovation, we need to bolster federal funding for university research through USDA, NEFA, and AFRI foundational programs. I also think land-grant universities have an aging infrastructure for livestock research, and this needs to be addressed at, at some point. Well, Dr. Oatley, uh, thank you for your response and your answers, and I couldn't agree with your final comments. Uh, um, I think it's important that we uh, make those investments. Um, the next uh, gentleman is a colleague and a good friend of mine from uh, the Sunshine State we call California, uh, Representative Salud Carvajal. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to all the witnesses uh, joining us today. Uh, Dr. Oatley, biotechnology has great potential to help address many of the challenges facing agriculture in our society today. Academic research is essential as we advance these technologies. I have seen incredible progress made through universities in my district, such as Cal Poly San Luis Obispo. With your experience as the Associate Dean of Research at Washington State University, what recommendations would you offer Congress to help improve the ability to deploy or better utilize important innovations happening within our education system? Thank you for the question. I think at land grant universities, um, our funding for doing research is primarily extramurally awarded by um, agencies such as the USDA, NEFA, AFRI foundational programs. 
I think that the funding for the foundational granting mechanisms through the USDA, NEFA, and the AFRI program is not kept pace with the cost of doing research. It's more expensive now to do animal research than it was even five years ago. It's more expensive for the personnel to do the research. It's more expensive to keep animals on a university campus to do research. It's more expensive to run the research labs. And yet the funding that's available through extramural grant awards has not kept pace. Our infrastructure is also aging. The infrastructure that was put in place for conducting livestock research, large animal research at our land grant universities and supported federally is aging. And now we're looking to how do we improve that infrastructure? Does it come from the private sector or is this something that should be supported at the federal level? I would think it should be supported at the federal level being land grant universities. So I think that a bolstering of the funding available for basic and applied research in the universities and an improvement to our aging infrastructure is desperately needed. Thank you very much. Mr. Bobo, finding innovative ways to make our food system more sustainable and resilient is becoming increasingly important. However, global acceptance of biotechnology products continues to be inconsistent. And I know we touched on this with several of my colleagues questions earlier. Mr. Bobo, how have uncertainties regarding other countries' approvals of new genetically engineered products affected U.S. seed and biotechnology companies? What can be done to increase acceptance of biotechnology products abroad? Yeah, so there have been dramatic impacts of the decisions that other countries have made. It could be China uh, blocking imports of food, which caused disruptions around the world. Um, it could be slow regulatory approvals in Europe that caused delays of years in the adoption of products in the United States. So slowing down the adoption, increasing the cost, all of those things have a dramatic impact and a chilling effect in other parts of the world. And so there needs to be more investment in other places, not just here in the United States. But you know, to be clear, we, uh, we invest 50 to 100 times more in medical health than we do in agriculture. And yet one of the biggest drivers of health impacts is food and the food choices we make. And so uh, I, I think that there's a, a big opportunity to help other countries to develop technologies so that they have a dramatic, uh, understand the benefits of these technologies for themselves. Uh, dialogue with Europe, uh, the changes that have happened in Japan, I think are very uh, uh, encouraging and we need to leverage those conversations with other places like China and Europe. Um, there have been recent developments in the UK, they're opening up to gene editing. Um, very critical conversations should be happening around that to leverage that movement in order to shape uh, global opinion. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair, I yield back. I thank the gentleman uh, from uh, the uh, Great Central Coast uh, for his questions and observations. Uh, the next uh, member that uh, is in the order given to me is representative from uh, Minnesota, uh, Mr. Jim Higledorn, and that will be followed by the uh, next uh, uh, member from Mr. Lawson, I believe. Uh, so I'm trying to let members know in terms of the order. So when you're up next, um, uh, Mr. Uh, Aguilar from uh, Minnesota. Thank you, Chairman Acosta. I appreciate you and uh, the other chairs and ranking members for holding this hearing and the witnesses for testifying. I really appreciate it. It's a very important subject and it's uh, one that we should keep addressing. Um, I happen to represent Southern Minnesota's first district which uh, has some of the great uh, grain and livestock farmers in our country. We, uh, we happen to rank number two for hogs as far as the value, I think number three uh, for the number of hogs produced. And so, uh, you know, pork production is really important to us. Long before anybody had ever heard of COVID-19, uh, I was on the House floor and working in bipartisan fashion with many members of this committee uh, to make sure that we could address something called African swine fever. And you know, African swine fever is one of those things that uh, we really need to make sure we protect our producers in America at the ports with more uh, folks to do inspections, the Beagle Brigades and everything else. And uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd, I'd 
encourage you to maybe we can bring the USDA and, and DHS people down and talk a little bit about their plan for how we would address uh, an outbreak of African swine fever in our country, particularly since uh, USDA just found it in the Caribbean. It's getting a little close and we need to do everything we can. So uh, if, if we can move on that, that would be terrific in the near future. The, uh, the problem with this disease that it killed 7 million or more hogs in places like China and Vietnam, it'd just be devastating if it came into the United States. And it wouldn't just be pork producers. We'd be talking about everybody up and down the chain, you know, it's, it's seed corn dealers. Uh, you're looking at feed mills, uh, implement dealers, packers, truckers, grocers, and of course, consumers would be harmed the most in the end, probably with much higher prices and less choice. And all that spills into our rural communities. If uh, hog production in, in areas like ours is down, that means less people shopping on Main Street, going to our schools and everything else. So I'd say that um, this is an issue that we should keep investigating. I would ask all the witnesses to please chime in. Is there a, you know, what do you think we can do? If you could speak to the detail of biotechnology research for African swine fever, what's going on? Where do you think it needs to go? You know, how far along are we? That type of thing. I can I can chime in on that question again with you know the the need to understand why some wild populations of of animals are resistant to things like African swine fever like the warthog. So I think there's biotechnology applications in the form of gene editing to try to address that. Um, but I think there's another uh, angle to work there, and that's also targeting the vector, and that is the tick that is transmitting the virus. Um, amongst animals. And so I think there's a, it's, it's a two-pronged approach, probably gene editing of an animal, but also targeting the vector through vaccines or other strategies to eliminate um, the, the ticks that are carrying the virus. Something like that would be quite a bit down the road though, right? We're not talking about even next year, it could be a lot longer. So You'd recommend that the government do everything possible in order to protect uh, the country, not allow the those those hogs and hog products to come in our country and and disease our population. Correct. In the short term, yes. Any of the other witnesses like to discuss this issue a little bit? I, I think just recent progress that USDA demonstrated the new vaccine against ASF, we're very encouraged by that vaccine. It seems to be working better than any previous vaccine we've seen. So that's really promising. In terms of biotechnology application, we are at the beginning and it's gonna be a long time before we will find solution. But I want to say that where we are with other biotechnology traits might have chilling effect on how much investment would be put toward ASF. If we cannot bring even products that already showed efficacy to the market, or it takes for a very long time and a lot of a very expensive process, it does have a really chilling effect on how much investment will be in the future toward ASF and other diseases. So you recommend common sense regulations, streamlined regulations, Absolutely. working uh, internationally and everything else, right? Absolutely. Make it faster. That would really help. And we only have about 20 seconds left. I appreciate your answers. This is really a subject we're going to continue to press upon. It would be just devastating to our consumers and everybody in the hog industry if uh, if we were had an outbreak in the United States. So I appreciate everybody uh, supporting this uh, this effort. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. The gentleman yields back his time, and uh, the chair will now recognize the. Uh, the uh, gentleperson uh, from Florida, uh, Mr. Lawson, for five minutes, and that will be followed by uh, uh, Representative uh, Feenstra from Iowa. Representative Lawson, you are recognized. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, for this meeting and ranking member. And I welcome all the members uh, to the panel. Uh, Mr. Oakley, uh, you spoke a little about how America negative perception of food derived from the GMOs has presented a major barrier of advancing biotechnology application to improve livestock productions. Now, the critical question is, what are some of the things that can be done, especially by Congress, if we can do anything, to increase public approval? Thank you for the question. 
Yeah, I, I think that the public acceptance of biotechnology applications in food is absolutely critical. We can do the most important and the coolest science in the lab, but if we can't advance it into the public because it's not accepted, then what's it for? Um, I do believe that there's a lack of understanding about science behind biotechnology in the, in the general public domain. And that's because it was a narrative shaped 20 years ago and has been being handed down from generation to generation. I think the science, the application, the importance of the use of biotechnologies to improve food production is very different now. At Washington State University, we are working towards trying to develop a new public narrative on gene editing of livestock by interlacing science with bioethics. Prior to the pandemic, we were gearing up for a major public engagement campaign that would start locally, hopefully grow statewide, and hopefully find traction nationally. I do think land-grant universities have an opportunity in serving as a think tank and opinion uh, makers to play a role in changing the public narrative on biotechnology and animals. I guess I would encourage Congress to find ways to support that through federal grants or other, other ways to fund the efforts that are going on at land-grant universities to engage at the public level better, even down to having educational programs at our grade school and high school levels about what gene editing is and how it can help feed the future. Okay, thank you very much. And, and uh, within the U.S., multiple federal agencies have regulatory jurisdiction over approval of agricultural biotechnology, as you just uh, mentioned earlier. And traditionally, the process for approval is time consuming and burdensome. And this is for the whole panel. Uh, in your opinion, what are some changes that need to be made to streamline the process of approval and to ensure that small and mid-sized companies, small and mid-sized companies can still compete in research and innovation in agricultural biotechnology for the whole panel? Well, I would just jump in and say that the lower the regulatory burden, the more companies will be in the field. You know, it's guaranteed that, um, you know, if we can minimize the, the red tape, that more companies will be able to do it and bring products to market. Uh, second, I would say that, you know, we, we still need more investment and that would benefit small and medium sized companies more than others. And, you know, finally, to the consumer acceptance piece, you know, we need to bring products to market that people want and love. In Japan, they're bringing a tomato that lowers blood pressure and they're selling seeds directly to consumers so you can grow these heart healthy oil, uh, tomatoes right at home. And so, you know, we need to think about products that are going to be relevant to consumers. Hey, Congressman uh, Lawson, I think that that is one of the things is to have a, a, a product that excites the consumer's imagination, right? So we cannot ask consumers to accept technology. I think that's difficult. We have to ask consumer to think about what is important for them from a food perspective. So we use Impossible Burgers all the time. It's a huge consumer, um, has a huge consumer pull and it is used GMO soybean. So I think the future is here and we have to make a distinction between gene editing where we're you know, modifying within the animal and the plant's genome that could occur in nature or through conventional breeding. And I think that is changing the narrative of consumer acceptance, not just in this country, but around the world. Dr. Oli, I'm sorry, I cut you off. No worries. I was just gonna add that I think the current um, regulatory framework is somewhat unnecessarily cumbersome and expensive for many gene editing applications. And I think the process is potentially too ambiguous for gene editing um, and, and the pace of review is somewhat glacial. So I think if we're gonna foster innovation to design that farm animal of the future, the gene edits that can, and, and can arise in nature and be propagated by selective breeding should have limited regulatory oversight. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm gonna yield back, but uh, for the record, Mr. Chairman, I wanna know what kind of tomato that is, is that gonna lower blood pressure? You know, and so if you can get some information back, that'll be interesting. Well, if I find that tomato, uh, my friend, uh, I will make it mandatory that a case be supplied to every member of the Agriculture Committee because we could certainly use that to lower our collective blood pressure. Okay. <laughs> good health. Um, we'll work on that. All right. One of the takeaways of this joint subcommittee hearing. Uh, the next uh, uh, person that um, 
uh, we have to recognize Mr. Uh, Fienstra uh, from Iowa. And then that follows by uh, my friend and colleague uh, from California, Mr. Panetta. Mr. Finster, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Costa, Chairman Plaskett, and all the ranking members of Baird and Johnson. Thank you for having us today. Very informative. As many of you know, uh, Iowa's Norman Borlaug and all his work uh, contributed extensively to, to uh, increases in agriculture production using uh, genetics and, and gene editing and things like that. So obviously I'm very supportive of the use of genetic innovation to help improve resiliency in our, in our crops, our flocks, our herds, animal diseases, and everything. As the U.S. continues to develop products through biotechnology, it is important that we streamline the regulatory approval process that we just talked about. We cannot let our, our own regulatory hurdles get in the way of more productive agriculture and global competitiveness. Uh, with gene editing, and biotechnology, a lack of information can also lead to a lack of trust. And we're seeing that around the world. And Dr. Chow, I just wanna uh, ask you, back in your time, during your time at USDA, what was the position at that time or what do you think the position is today on gene editing of our agricultural food products? I think the position at USDA when I was there just a few years ago and now has not changed. Uh, we need to use all the technology that we have in our, in our toolbox to, to make our agriculture more sustainable, both productive and also sustainable. And I think the latest secretary's initiative on that, it, it demonstrates that it has not, I think that attitude hasn't changed. But I think it's uh, what we've been talking about here is potential. It's a dream. We need a plan right, to achieve what we need to achieve. And that it's both from a regulatory perspective, how we modify or modernize our regulatory system so we recognize this experience we have gained in all these years regulating products and also the new science and new evidence that's out there. So we're not asking to decrease the regulatory burden unnecessarily. We're asking that regulatory burden to be justified by the risk. So I think that is all we're, that's what we're asking for. So for these new products that could have been done through conventional breeding, both on the animal side and the plant side, there are multiple layers of oversight, both from a public perspective and a private perspective that ensures that these products are safe for consumption and for production. So that additional regulatory hurdle from the government side needs to be proportionate to the risk we're talking about here. Yeah. We also yeah. need research investment. I think that's super important as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah I would agree. Do, do you think uh, the department, uh, you know, I, I think there's a, a PR issue, a public relations issue with the public and, and what the public sometimes perceives uh, as, as concerns. Uh, do you think there's anything that we can do there to, to create better perception in this arena? I think we all have a role in that. I think from a regulatory perspective, the job of the regulatory agency is to ensure that we have a safe food supply. It is not the job of the regulatory agency to ensure that there's market acceptance. They need to regulate based on real risk, not perceived risk. It is incumbent on the rest of us in the agricultural community to actually talk about why we do the things we do. I think Jack mentioned this. We can do lots of these things, but why do we do it? We do it from animal welfare purposes. We do it from climate change purposes. We do it from a food security and nutritional security purposes. And those are things that matter to consumers. Yep. So I think that is where we need to focus our attention. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for your comments. So uh, just like uh, uh, my good friend, uh, Representative Hagedorn, I have the largest uh, swine production uh, in my district. And obviously, I'm very concerned about African swine's fever and, and what's happening. Dr. Oatley, uh, does the approach pr proposed by the USDA in its uh, ANPR make sense for animal innovations? And do you see USDA having a role in the regulation of animal agriculture innovations moving forward? Yeah, thanks for the question. I, I absolutely do see a role for the USDA, and I am very much supportive of that advance notice for proposed rulemaking that was released by the USDA. Um, when it comes to African swine fever, as we've talked about several times during this hearing already, I think if we're going to use biotechnologies, it's probably years out before we address that. So we need a, we need a quicker solution for addressing the potential threat now. But the long-term solution, I think, rests with biotechnology, with gene editing. Um, again, I think the pace at which the um, discoveries can be advanced from concept in a research lab to developing through a re research and development pipeline and then getting into commercial channels is influenced greatly by the federal regulatory landscape. 
And so some sort of coordinated landscape um, process that is coordinated between the USDA and the FDA, I think is critical going forward. Um, I think many small businesses, even academic labs that are trying to develop applications in this space, start to just fall off into the margins as the process for monitoring and approval becomes more burdensome and more costly, and that's stifling the innovation. Yep, yep. Thank you, Dr. Early. I fully agree with you, and we have a lot of uh, private organizations, nonprofits in uh, my area that are doing that. Thank you, and I yield back. Thank the uh, gentleman uh, from, um, uh, for your questions, and uh, uh, my um, uh, colleague from California, uh, representing a wonderful part of California's Central Coast, uh, Congress member Jimmy Panetta. Uh, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chair Costa, and thank you, Chair Plaskett, and of course, the ranking members for this uh, joint hearing. Really appreciate this opportunity, and of course, thanks to all the witnesses. Uh, who uh, showed up today via Zoom. Thank you very much. Um, I want to address just a couple of areas. I know a lot have been already mentioned. So let me just focus on uh, public-private partnerships. One, and I'm going to hit Dr. Chow with that question, and then the increasing acceptance of biotech abroad. And I'm going to ask Mr. Bobo and Dr. Rice on that. So Dr. Chow, obviously, thank you for being here. Um, as you heard, you might have heard mentioned by Rodney Davis, my co-chair of the Ag Research Caucus, um, we've been able to uh, work pretty well or at least see the success of public-private partnerships, especially, especially when they leverage the USDA and its resources. And so I was wondering, Dr. Chow, when it comes to biotechnology innovation, can you provide some real-world examples of public-private partnerships in action? And if anybody else would like to weigh in, feel free to do it. But I'll start with Dr. Chow. I think as you look at public-private partnership that's funded by USDA and NIFA, we have to focus on gene editing. Because of the regulatory burden for traditional GM products, they have never invested in that because it just they cannot meet that regulatory hurdle. So a couple examples on gene editing that is cover crops. There is a consortium that's funded by NIFA of public universities in, in all across the Midwest states, including a private company, a small company, a startup company that is gene editing penny crust, that's a cover crop, so that the oils are now edible and can be used in animal feed. So farmers can plant it from an environmental perspective, but they can also sell the seeds now for a cash crop perspective. So that is, in early commercial stages, and it's very exciting. The, uh, another thing that ARS has been funding is this consortium with another startup company called Parawise, but is looking at the genetic diversity with it within berries and trying to use gene editing to make discovery, but also to implement that so the berries can be thornless, can have better nutrition, so that there's more availability to consumers and to producers. So those are two things that where there is specific investment and utility of gene editing. But I think there are some ex great examples of public and par private partnership that goes beyond gene editing. It's plant breeding, right? UC Davis strawberry program, putting out 60 varieties, a patented variety of strawberries, which is 93% of what's been grown in California, a great public private partnership. The GEM pro um, program, the germplasm for maize, land grant universities, private, un private companies bringing new corn germplasm into the US. So those are two great examples on the plant side uh, for continued, continued public-private partnerships. Great, great. And I just got some time here, so I want to move on to my next area of questions, and that's the acceptance of biotech abroad. Obviously, we've heard about the challenges that producers in the biotech industry face when it comes to increasing acceptance of biotechnology product, products, not just here, as I think Dr. Uh, Mr. Lawson, Representative Lawson talked about, but also abroad. And we know that there are consumers that are very skeptical uh, abroad, obviously here too, but also abroad. How can our government help those consumers understand the safety and efficacy of those tech of these technologies that we've been talking about? And uh, obviously, um, is it, it it's more pronounced? I think you know in other in other nations than than in the United States. So what can we do to help those nations come to a more of an acceptance? If uh, Mr. Bobo or Dr. Rice, if you want to take that question. Yeah, I can I can begin. Uh, that This was my job when I was at the State Department for 12 years. I traveled to 50 countries, met with scientists, uh, policymakers, and others. Uh, 
within the State Department, there are outreach funds. So there's PR efforts that are done to hold meetings, to um, do workshops and other things. Similarly, the Foreign Agricultural Service every day is out there having these conversations with other governments about their regulations, about the potential of the technology, advocating for partnerships with US institutions. Uh, but the funding for those outreach programs is about a million dollars a year. You know, and when you think about a hundred billion dollar industry, one might think that we could be investing a little bit more whenever there's a regulatory or disruption. Um, you know, it costs hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars. And so, you know, we, we could provide more resources to those agencies that are on the front lines. And so, oh, yeah, ahead. I can just add, add that we've conducted several rounds of consumer research and what we see out of the of this research that for consumers regulatory approval is extremely important and as well as safety uh, and testing of the products but also what is important is the communication about the benefits of those products so this is on the top of the mind for consumer acceptance and a uh, simple answer to your question congressman is we need to ensure U.S. regulatory framework is functional, fit for purpose, and information about benefits is broadly available. Great. Thank you, Dr. Rice. Thanks to all the witnesses. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank the gentleman uh, for his comments and, and questions. And uh, uh, staff uh, uh, and I have coordinated with the uh, my co-chair, uh, Representative Baskett, on this. And uh, what we will do, uh, I, I believe it's the last uh, member uh, to ask questions uh, that I have before me is Representative Fishbach. Oh, and I'm, and I'm told uh, Barry Moore from Alabama. So uh, it's the chair's intention to uh, close this, uh, uh, the joint hearing between the two subcommittees after uh, the gentleman from Alabama has a chance to ask uh, questions. And then we'll allow a brief opportunity for uh, the uh, my co-chair and, and, and the ranking members if they have any uh, thoughts that they would like to follow up with so that we can, with the busy schedule that we all have uh, with this afternoon and this week, uh, conclude uh, the, uh, the hearing. So with that said, uh, Representative Fishbach from Minnesota, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. And, and you know, I'd just like to uh, explore a little bit. I know that uh, Congressman Feenstra was talking to Dr. Oatley about uh, a little bit about the FDA process. And I understand you have firsthand, uh, firsthand experience with that. Uh, you, you, you used the phrase coordinated landscape and, and you mentioned, like I said, you mentioned a little bit earlier, I'm wondering if you could potentially expand on that. You know, there's a, uh, what kind of things that we could do to improve that process because I, I'm, I'm very, very you know, excited about the use of a biotechnology, particularly in the ag field. And I think that uh, there's great strides that can be, we can make, but don't want um, those kinds of burdens in the way of innovation and, um, and our move forward. And so uh, just, you know, I know you have the experience if there's, you want to walk us through the process and maybe offer um, offer uh, improvements or how you would like to approach that since you do have the firsthand experience. So I will, uh, but what, what can we do to um, help that process and potentially even lower those costs to get these products, uh, or, you know, get this innovation uh, moving? Thank you for the question. Now, let me first say that my experience with the FDA approval process is at the investigational stage. That's um, the kind of first um, line of communication with the FDA by opening an investigational new animal drug filing. And um, I do have several of those now. Essentially, this, this allows for communication with the FDA to share information about what the gene editing application is in a food animal. Um, the FDA has created a few other channels that are less bureaucratic, but really they all converge into this first step of of having an investigational new animal drug filing um, when you're going from concept of gene editing application to trying to get final approval that would be in the form of an investigational new animal drug filing. Um, with these filings in hand, a developer like myself can share information about the concept, provide experimental data uh, supporting the concept. At some point when enough data has been collected and the concept has been matured experimentally, 
then the investigation filing gets converted to the next stage. Um, and that's where a more rigorous process kicks in and eventually leading to a decision making point. I think the challenges for developers like myself is the ambiguity in what defines the next steps, the ambiguity in what information is needed to progress along the process. And in my experience, it seems like it's a show me what you got and we'll tell you whether it's good enough approach. And that's discouraging for early stage investigators. Um, it's also somewhat expensive if you're, a not, if you're not a nonprofit organization. So every year that that investigational new animal drug filing exists, there's a maintenance fee that's rather hefty that must be applied. We get exemptions by being a land grant university from having to pay that fee. But if we were a small business um, or a large company, we wouldn't have those same exemptions. And so it becomes quite expensive to maintain those filings, which I think suppresses the small business early stage developers. I think that having a process where we can streamline the assessment and the approval in such that changes in the DNA that are being made to animals that can and probably do arise in nature are, are, are addressed with enforcement discretion and have limited oversight because we're probably already eating products from animals that have these changes at some level. We just don't screen millions and millions of animals looking for that rare variant. And so I think there needs to be different sets of criteria, different paces of oversight, different paces of approval, and different costs of those approvals based on the type of gene editing that is being, um, being pursued. Thank you very much. And I just have a few, uh, less than a minute left. If anyone, if any of the other panelists wanted to add to that. Well then, thank you very much, Mr. Chair, and I yield back. I thank the uh, gentleman, gentlewoman for her uh, comments and questions. The next uh, member of the uh, subcommittee is Mr. Moore from uh, Alabama, who uh, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and uh, I appreciate all the witnesses appearing before the committee today. Um, I'd like to follow up on a few of the questions so far relating to the federal regulations of the biotechnologies. Many countries around the globe have a single regulatory entity that oversees agricultural biotechnologies. But in the United States, we have three, the USDA, the EPA, and the FDA. Dr. Chow, for our education, can you provide sort of a brief overview of what each of these agencies play? What part? Sure. I'll just talk, it, talk about it from the plant perspective where three agencies play, and it's based on what the intended product will do. So FDA will regulate food and feed to make sure it's safe for animals and humans to consume. USDA will regulate the products for agricultural purposes, so it's safe for planting. An EPA, it regulates products if there is an intended pesticidal effect. It's a little bit in the weeds. So only a, a specific plant that perhaps is um, bred to protect it itself against pests, EPA will regulate that. So, so in this way, to, to, to Dr. Oli's point, if you're a, a researcher in university, trying to figure that out is pretty difficult. And so USDA and FDA and EPA actually has a joint website now that you can ask a question that this is my product, who should I talk to? And they jointly have to respond to an answer. So there are efforts to streamline the process and make it more approachable. Okay, thank you, Dr. Chow. I have no further questions, Mr. Chairman, thank you. All right, uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Moore. And I, I believe our last member uh, to um, um, ask uh, questions or make some comments is uh, Representative Letlow uh, from Louisiana. You're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Costa, and thank you to the witnesses for your time and testimony here today. Agriculture research and innovation is at the forefront of agriculture resiliency and sustainability across this nation and abroad. Whether it's adopting new practices, implementing new technologies, or mitigating for potential risks, research plays an essential role in the implementation of new biotechnologies. In my home state of Louisiana, the LSU Agricultural Center is one of nine campuses of the LSU system. 
Its main focus is on research, extension, and teaching to make advancements that will benefit future generations. Research conducted by the LSU Ag Center examines ways to expand the food and fiber supply while improving agriculture's valuable contributions to the state's economy. Through Dr. Mike Deliberto's research on production agriculture at the LSU Ag Center, advances in biotechnology have allowed commodity producers to increase output in an efficient manner. One example of this great work is the rice breeding project at the H. Ralph Caffey Rice Research Station in Crowley. Their primary objective is the development of superior varieties with emphasis on herbicide resistance. In addition to studies examining the direct or indirect contributions of variety development like milling quality and mutation breeding. In 2019, the Food and Drug Administration indicated that it would develop guidance for foods derived from new plant varieties produced using genome editing. However, it is now late 2021, almost two and a half years later, and FDA has not yet published this guidance. <clears throat> to any of the witnesses, how important is it to the research and developer community that FDA clarify its approach to gene editing? And secondly, does the current lack of guidance have any impact on the consistency of the regulatory approach to gene editing internationally? Congresswoman Lutlow, if you can allow me to start, I'm sure everyone has an opinion on this. I think it's really important as um, the previous congressman mentioned, we have three agencies. So the three agencies need to be coordinated, not just in the regulatory approach, but they're in timeline. So right now, FDA not putting out their clarifying policy, it is a bit concerning, right? So we do need all three agencies to be coordinated. From an international perspective, it makes it difficult for us to advocate from a public sector perspective, from a government perspective, because our house is quite not in order. So in that way, we need our three agencies to get together to get our house in order so we can remain leaders, not just in research and development and in commercial production, but also in regulatory science and regulations. So in that view, I really, we are really looking towards a three agency to work better together so that they're putting out policies together, that they're coordinating and collaborating and not just sharing information, but actually working together to make sure that there is not too much duplicity in the work in the way they regulate and to be as streamlined as possible, especially I think for these products of gene editing, where we are working within the plant and animal genome that could have been done through conventional breeding or naturally occurring. I know we keep coming back to that point, but this is really the 21st century advances that we're trying to talk about here. Thank you. Would anybody else like to comment? I speak on the animal side. I'd say that genetic engineering of animals right now goes through a drug review process at the FDA. That drug review process was set forth by the Federal Food Drug and Cosmetic, Cos Cosmetic Act. And this assigned regulatory oversight of genetically modified animals to the FDA. Through interpretation of that authority, substances other than food that affect the structure and function of an animal are considered to be a drug. And so as molecular elements like DNA that alter the genome of an animal are now considered a drug. And this act was established during a time of, of genetic engineering called transgenesis that used recombinant DNA to alter the genome, put something foreign into the genome. That's not the state of the art for gene editing. And so I think continuing to regulate it as a drug in changes to the DNA that can and do arise in nature is not aligned with the state of the art of the science, as well as the pace of development. Thank you for this. I think comment. another critical point here to bring up that the absence of clarity today between three agencies, um, the fact that animal gene editing is being regulated as drug, but not in plant gene editing, all confuses our consumers. And what we see in that when consumers confused, they refuse to accept the technology and products that originate from the technology. And that's what we see as a major issue today, because at the end, the products only will be available to the market if consumers will accept them. Thank you so much. I appreciate those responses. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. I thank the uh, representative for yielding back. Uh, her time has expired. And uh, now um, uh, with uh, the support of uh, both uh, subcommittees, I'd like to bring this uh, hearing to a close. 
Mr. Johnson has indicated that um, he has had to, to leave uh, for other appointments. Uh, Mr. Thompson, do you have any closing comment you'd like to make? I guess not. Uh, Mr. Bear, do you have any closing comment you would like to make? Yes, Mr. Chairman, I would. I really appreciate that opportunity because I want to express how much I've appreciated uh, the witnesses today and, and the expert work that they're doing and that, that it uh, really is encouraging to me that we recognize that biotechnology and agriculture uh, really does represent a true bright spot in the future uh, for our global economy. And so with that, I just want to say that uh, that we also, uh, in the discussions today, recognize that we need to ensure that regulation does not stifle in with the innovation and the appropriate agencies regulate the technology of agriculture and that where interagency cooperation in regulation is unavoidable, that it happens efficiently. So I can't tell you how much I enjoyed hearing the witnesses today. Uh, I could have spent the rest of the afternoon uh, <laughs> discussing some of these issues. So. I want to make sure that we thank them for being here. And I yield back. Thank you. Okay. Well, we, we thank you uh, for your enthusiasm and your focus. And uh, uh, I will now yield uh, to my uh, to our colleague and, and co-chair, who without her uh, participation and enthusiasm and focus and her staff's efforts, this joint subcommittee hearing would not have been possible. So Chairwoman Plaskett, for any closing comments you would like, might like to make. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. And thank you so much to my colleagues on both sides of the aisle for what I believe was an extremely informative discussion. And of course, to the witnesses who uh, their expertise has been invaluable to us, not only understanding what is happening in this field, but supporting us in uh, make, trying to make decisions about how Congress plays a role in this. As we bring the hearing to the close, I, of course, want to thank the staff, both mine, yours, Mr. Costa, as well, in particular, the committee staff who've made this possible, and our colleagues who took time um, to be here and ask really pertinent questions. As the last year has made abundantly clear, it's crucial that we continue to find ways <clears throat> to increase the resiliency of our food and agricultural systems. We need to work with researchers and farmers to accelerate efforts to develop crops and animals that are better suited to adapt to the increasingly severe impacts of climate change and paired with improved practices better help us mitigate climate change. Um, as well, we have learned that there is in fact a role both for us as regulators and to the industry to make uh, consumers feel more comfortable with the strides that science has been made and I can't wait to get to work with my um, colleague and ranking member, Mr. Baird, to see how our subcommittee in working with you, Mr. Costa and others and Mr. Johnson, as well as the full committee can make this a reality. Thank you so much and for the time. And I yield back to you, Chair Costa. Well, thank you very much, uh, Chairwoman uh, Plaskett uh, for your comments. I couldn't agree with you more. Uh, and I too also want to thank uh, uh, the ranking members and, and I think this has been a good use of time by both subcommittee members uh, in working together on uh, what really is an overlap of interest by both of our subcommittees. Uh, the panel uh, experts uh, today uh, provided not only important testimony, but I think did a very good job of answering the questions. I'm sure there will be follow up. Uh, one thing that uh, has struck me in listening to today's uh, testimony is the technological jump that I think is uh, taking place not only in the last decade, but certainly in the next. And it has to be. It has to be with the uh, population growth that we've all talked about here uh, by the middle of the century, it being almost 10 billion people. We're over seven and a half now at this point in time and trying to produce more food uh, for our nation and for this planet with less uh, is in light of climate change, a tall order to say the least. And um, so I think it's important that the takeaways uh, from today's hearing uh, is something that both subcommittees will focus on and our staff on how we incentivize innovation in agriculture 
deal with some of the larger threats that are facing in terms of drought, uh, uh, extreme drought conditions that we find ourselves in, dealing with uh, efforts that are provide threats and uh, disease resistant animals and drought uh, tolerant crops. Two things that are critical to our food supply chain and technology is gonna be a key part of how we make sustainability um, a greater part of our ability to produce food. So sustainability, frankly, <clears throat> has been a part of our success, but we need to do more. We have to do more. Um, and I think, uh, as you hear me say regularly, and I think most of the members of the committee share this thought, food is not only a national security issue, but a world security issue. Food and fiber that so many folks take for granted that's on their dinner table every night cannot happen unless we ensure that we have a robust and sustainable ability to produce that, that uh, absolutely necessary uh, nutrition for our sustenance. And, um, and it's important that uh, with the global dynamics uh, changing, that we uh, integrate new technologies in agriculture and that we can prepare for that change. So once again, I wanna thank the witnesses uh, and the researchers and the advocates to figure out how we can continue to build uh, better efforts in terms of public private partnerships uh, with our universities throughout the country and through the private sector. It has been, I think, a key on how we've done so well thus far, but obviously we need to do more and, and have it scaled neutral uh, for new technologies for our agricultural producers. Um, the bottom line is, is if we do this, we can um, address the challenges of the future for sustainability in the production of food and fiber, not only for our nation, but for the world. So <clears throat> with that, uh, under the rules of the committee, uh, the record of today's hearing will remain open for 10 calendar days to receive additional material and supplement written responses from witnesses to any question posed for the members. So again, to our, our, our witnesses who did a terrific job today, uh, we may have follow-up questions for you uh, by members of the committee, because we really wanna ensure that the takeaways from this uh, joint subcommittee hearing um, uh, are something that we can build on. And that's what I hope will take place. So the joint committee hearing of the subcommittee on livestock and foreign agriculture and the subcommittee on biotechnology and horticulture and research with the support of my co-chair is now adjourned. Thank you very much.